Yes, please. Okay. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to the third webinar in the series of Asian US group webinars on interventional EUS. Um, this has been a very, very encouraging series of webinars for us, and we are seeing increasing uh, number of responses and increasing countries joining us uh, over the past three webinars. So today we have um, people uh, or delegates or whatever you call them from 65 countries joining us. And mind you, this is a highly selective webinar. This is only for EUS and that to EUS specific strengths. So we are very, very encouraged by this response. Thank you very much, all of you who are joining us uh, today. I will uh, not be able to mention all the countries from where you all have joined us, um, but I'll mention a few, uh, Chile, Bangladesh, Brazil, of course, Hong Kong and India have major contributions. Then Korea, Japan, Israel, Iraq, Morocco, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Philippines, Thailand has a very big contingent. Korea has lots of people joining in. Um, USA, 25 people had joined in and UK, France, um, very, very nice list, Italy. So thank you all for joining uh, uh, and spending your time with us for the next four hours. I should thank Olympus, Cook, Wong and of course Boston Scientific for helping us with these efforts and um, it is it is really really uh, makes us very happy at the response that we get from these. So um, today's um, webinar topic is very close to my heart um, and uh, the idea I got uh, of the webinar from a discussion which I had with Dr. Nageshwar Reddy a few months back. So we have endoscopists, we have great endoscopists, and then we have innovators. Innovators are no doubt great endoscopists, but they also think continuously of how to improve upon the procedures, how to bring in technology so that our life as endoscopists become easier. So we were having this, uh, I was having this discussion with Nagi on what makes a person an innovator. And, and this is uh, the basic theme. It was there at the back of my mind. And we, after discussing with Lawrence and Anthony, we decided that this should be our, hi Ali, uh, Professor Ali Agoto is here. So um, we decided to have this webinar. I thought this would be a bit serious theme, but I'm very happy that uh, about 650 people are uh, joining us for this uh, webinar. And I think that is because of the um, faculty that we uh, have uh, been able to have with us. We have people who are, who are really great uh, endoscopists and great innovators. Um, so a good, good combination of both, uh, both the things. And um, I hope the next four hours that you spend with us will give you pearls of wisdom. From not only so, you will yourself, all of you, will think of innovation as something very, very integral to endoscopy. <laughs> so I request uh, Lawrence uh, to take over from here and tell us something about the AEG and then, of course, introduce Nagi. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Vinay, for this opportunity. Um, can I uh, maybe use a slide and share the slide? Yeah, I thought, uh, well, since uh, our audience is getting more international, and some of you may still not be familiar with uh, uh, what this group is doing. Um, I think uh, Vinay asked me to perhaps a uh, few minutes uh, to introduce uh, this uh, particular group, which uh, hails from Asia, obviously, Asian US group. <laughs> and um, I think uh, we have been um, doing um, all these uh, workshops as well as uh, webinars uh, recently, as well as uh, for quite a number of years. 
So essentially, is uh, this group was formed uh, in two one two, and currently has uh, expanded its membership to encompass uh, almost uh, all countries in uh, Asia. There was only there's only a, a one uh, endpoint for this uh, particular group, which is to uh, to try to improve EUS adoption through training. And how we do the training is uh, we have been very lucky that there are many trainers around in Asia who are very willing to share their knowledge, expertise with other people. So I think in doing so, we have been very successful in trying to match the needs with the so-called, I think, uh, the, the, our supply of our trainers. So obviously, I think uh, most of the training has happened uh, before the COVID time. So I just very quickly take you through um, those memories which we have uh, cherished. Essentially, we've done a lot of local workshops in many different countries and trained the trainers, uh, horses, as well as some more recently interventional workshops. And obviously, I think we also have been uh, quite effective in imparting uh, these sort of skills as shown in a few publications. And more recently, I think uh, Vinay has uh, pioneered this uh, Mumbai school uh, in a bit to say that, well, perhaps I think uh, uh, workshops are short term. If we can also come up with something more long term, such as a school, then it will be even better for the training. So I think that has been done. And then obviously, I think uh, before this particular COVID time, we were able to meet uh, together and then come up with so-called consensus guidelines. And, uh, and this is perhaps uh, the sort of crown jewel. In, uh, every two years, uh, we were organizing the Asian EUS Congresses, perhaps the biggest kind of EUS specific Congresses uh, in Asia so far. And obviously, I think this year, as everybody knows, is a very extraordinary time. And uh, this is marked by the social distancing. And because of that reason, I think uh, Rene and uh, Anthony have taken upon themselves to organize a different form of workshops to continue on the so-called EUS training. Uh, they have started this monthly AG uh, webinars with hosting alternating between Mumbai and Hong Kong. It's still a learning curve for us, but I think uh, so far they've done extremely well, I must say, in terms of technology. If you notice some of the webinars, there was live case demo. It's not so easy to actually get three images in one particular uh, Zoom, uh, so-called. You have to have floral, EUS, endoscopy, and then room view. It's not easy. So there's a lot of learning involved. I think more importantly, now actually we discover that we can now reach out to more, many more people. I think the first workshop, I think uh, which was organized by Rene, yeah, there were 924 registrants. And then the second one in Hong Kong, we actually exceeded 1,000 registrants with 600 over attending on the same day. So I think uh, this is again the third one. And, uh, and uh, judging from the Mumbai webinar, uh, more than 90% found the webinar extremely useful. So this is where I'd like to actually congratulate Vinay for again doing it Again, this time, I'm sure you'll be very successful. So congratulate Vinny, and then we will go on straight to the, the session proper. So thank, thanks again for this opportunity. So uh, may, maybe I think uh, at this stage, I would like to um, <clears throat> uh, say upon the, I think, uh, take the theme forward. I think you mentioned about innovator. And uh, certainly, I think uh, uh, without much introduction, we all know that uh, Nagi, uh, it's not only a, a good, uh, excellent, world-class endoscopy, he's also very, I would say, extraordinary innovator. And most importantly, he is also a so-called world leader. He has established a world-class uh, Asian Institute of Gastroenterology. So today, we are very honored to have uh, Nagi to talk to us about his innovation, which is called Nagi Stan. Please. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. I'd like to thank um, the AEG, especially Vinay and Lawrence, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, when Vinay asked me to talk on the Nagi stent, I was a little embarrassed because you're talking, I have to keep mentioning this name all the time, and it looks a little odd. 
uh, yeah. So let me start first uh, by my conflicts of interest. Actually, it's a confession. And the confession is that I'm not an endosonologist. The topic we're dealing with is predominantly in the domain of endosonologist. I'm actually an ERCPS who has a passion for using the side wing scopy. And uh, my journey actually in treating these patients started with the side wing scope. So what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is to give a brief background of how this idea came, how it actually developed, what's the current status of the Nagi stent and what are the future that I see. Now, in 1990s up to 2010, what we're doing is that we were draining this pancreatic, uh, peripancreatic fluid by the technique using side wing endoscopy mostly. You see a bulge there, we'd make a small opening and then put in a stent. Uh, sometimes if there's a thick fluid like this, which was many of them were actually wands, uh, which were sometimes infected, we used to do a balloon dilatation. Now, all of this without endoscopic ultrasound guidance. It used to be purely using a side wing endoscope. Uh, the concept of using endoscopic ultrasound came a little later when Sham Bhardarajulu showed clearly that this was superior to using an endoscopy. Uh, so our concept was uh, to actually dilate this tract. Uh, we are lucky very often because uh, there were no complications, but when we achieved enough dilatation, we'd go in directly to do a necrosectomy. Uh, sometimes. Uh, but this was a procedure which was not very safe because of potential problems of these large dilatations. And one such experience we had during a workshop, you can see actually Todd Barron here, who was the innovator for starting this type of transgastric procedures. So this was one of our workshops at Hyderabad. He was doing this. And you can see that we dilated this opening to about 15 uh, minutes millimeters to enter inside and as soon as we dilated you can see the massive amount of bleed that's coming out. In fact this patient almost bled to death. What uh, quickly we did was to put in a large esophageal stent through the scope esophageal stent to actually stop the bleed and to open this up. So this gave us an idea that probably because of several problems that these stents have that we should think of something else that should be done because uh, whenever you do intervention with plastic stents in these cases, we have to do repeated interventions. There was increased chance of sepsis and of course potential complications like the one you saw now. So the other option was to use these covered stents which are already available to us at that point of time. Uh, the biliary stents which are 10 millimeters. They had larger lumen. Uh, they had an expansion uh, after they di dilated. It was quite adequate many times to drain the fluid better than plastic stents. But the problem with the standard the biliary stents were the very high migration rates. The edges were very sharp. And there was because they're very long, the incidence of blockage used to be quite high. So although for a short period of time, this was in 2008, the paper from Mikhail Kehela, for a short period of time, we were using these biliary stents. We stopped using them because of these problems. So we're looking at a stent which was, which could be, remember, not endoscopy ultrasound, but under the guidance of side wing scope, which could be used, which was easy to insert, uh, which decreased the need for necrosectomy, which had a low complication rate. And that's when I got this idea. This was in 2009. And I got this idea based upon another stent at that time, which had just come in. This was the Euro stent, which was being used in Amsterdam to create an anastomosis between uh, two lumens of the bowel. In fact, this was very early work that was being done uh, by Jenin and a group where they were using this uh, in, in actually the animal model. This was, a, this was an animal model to see if they can create anastomosis. So I also looked at what the cardiologists were using. The cardiologists for ASD and BSD were using occluders. And this was the basis I thought we should make our stent uh, for draining this peripancreatic fluid collections. And you can see this was ideally the stent which we thought of. So I gave this idea to uh, actually uh, to Taewung at that time, which, which was a meeting in Korea when I, when I actually talked to. This was Yangul Hong, who was uh, a brilliant engineer with uh, uh, Taewung. And he, uh, I gave him this idea and within a week he came out with drawings and all that. This was in 2008. He came out with his drawing saying that is this, uh, with this concept, do you think this tent is okay? Of course, it went through several phases. The first tent which we made, uh, the edges were only 16 millimeters. So we knew that we had to enlarge this. It was of course completely covered. 
we had to have a lasso because we pull on a lasso and only then uh, it actually shrunk and came out easily. The edges were initially very sharp, uh, so we had to smoothen this out. The initial angle was 35. We knew that this was not sufficient. Migration rate was still high. Uh, so we had to increase it to 53 degrees and have flares which are sufficiently big to avoid migration. Now remember the concept at that time was not to create a, a movement opposing stent. My idea was to use a side wing scope to use a very broad stent with high flares which can drain this peripancreatic fluid easily and which could be removed easily. Uh, so you can see finally what happened was the sharp edges were all taken out the thread prototype was finally made, uh, was available to us about 2011, which was what the current Nagi stent is with this lasso. Uh, and uh, this was the history of what actually happened. These ideas were given 2008 and 9. We made the first prototype. A lot of animal work was done at this period of time. And after the animal work was done, uh, we started using this tent in our own unit before actually it was commercially available. So for a year, we're using this tent, very, very encouraged with its use. Again, mainly we're using at that point of time, using a side wing endoscope. Uh, because uh, by that time, the concept of endoscopic ultrasound for some reason hadn't yet come in. And then uh, we started, and of course, further progress has been made with the hot Nagi now. Uh, of course, Fairwing was quite happy. They started to sell a lot of these stents. Uh, the basic concept was to keep a short stem. The stem actually we made three stems, one centimeter, two and three centimeters. We found that the most comfortable one was two centimeters to insert it through the side wing scope. Uh, through the EUS, of course, you can have a shorter stem, but through the side wing scope, you must have at least two centimeters because if it is one centimeter, it was uh, misplaced very often. The Japanese preferred a three centimeters one, so when Peiwung made it for the Japanese, they made it three centimeters stem, longer stem. Now, of course, the inner diameter was 16 centimeters. We now have also 20. And the external flaps went up to 2.5 and it was a completely covered stent. So this was uh, the concept. This had different lengths and the delivery system was 10.5. So this was the original stent. Now when the stent came, they didn't tell me this, but they called it the DNR stent. Now DNR could mean in US, do not resuscitate. So which was a dangerous thing for a stent to have. And again, I said, no, no, I don't think this is acceptable. You just call it um, pancreatic fluid stent or so on. But they came up with this idea, which, uh, which was not very good for me because one, it's um, it a lot to be sitting in the audience and somebody keeps talking about this. And also a lot of people think that uh, I get a royalty from this stent, which I don't. In fact, I buy these stents also for myself, unfortunately. And, uh, and what has happened over a period of time, they have sold a lot of stents, but uh, I, I, I don't make anything out of it, which is also unfortunate. I think Ken would tell you the same thing also. Ken Binmola is talking to him. So at this point of time, Ken and uh, not Ken, actually it was a company, Ex Lumina uh, and me had a little misunderstanding. I was actually doing all this development uh, without knowing what is happening in Ex Lumina. Uh, Ex, Ex Lumina, Ken had this brilliant stent, uh, which was doing the Lumina posing and Ken was endosonologist, so it was more ideal. He was creating this stent and uh, um, Ex Lumina thought that we had copied the idea. We didn't even know that they're having the stents and our stents are actually predominantly for side wing scope. Of course, later on, uh, uh, Ken and we had a laugh when we, when we discussed this later on and we made up for this. Uh, so this is the first stent being applied in 2010. We did the first uh, procedure in our unit and you can see we are using through the side wing endoscope, uh, done typically with a small balloon dilatation and then putting in the stent. And what was exciting for us was that unlike, pla unless, unlike plastic stents where you to really dilate a uh, lot, we didn't have to dilate much and we could actually go inside the stent immediately and uh, do a necrosectomy. We don't do this now, the concept is different, but at that point of time, it's exciting. So the first workshop where we demonstrated this stent, I think we never remember this, was in 2011 when we had our annual meeting of the SGI at WISAC. And you can see again, we're using a side wing scope here uh, and then putting this stent inside. So this was a side wing scope along with fluoroscopy was the way we used to use this stent. Uh, in 2012, uh, Itoi and uh, me, we actually Itoi came over to our unit to put some of these stents and together we published this first paper in Abdominary Pancreatic Sciences and uh, we demonstrated that this stent was very useful in, in situations of want. And you can see that we could go through the stent and do a necrosectomy also. Uh, 
And this is just to show that Itoi is involved with both the stents, the Nagi stent and the Axios stent. Uh, he was the first author for both. He did this with Bin Mola in the first, first case report. In fact, the first case report was uh, by me, Bin Mola and Shah in 2011, but this was the paper that attracted the most attention and similarly asked uh, was at that point of time. Uh, so, of course, there are many, many stents now. I think um, Dr. Moon is here. He was responsible for this PAX stent. Uh, one of the good things is that most companies now decided not to have a name to these stents and not to have a person's name, which I think is good because then you don't get associated with these uh, stents. There are other stents, like, for example, the Axis stent, which is now available in Germany, the Hanero stent. So, at least five of these stents are now available based on the initial concept. They have different types of expansive stents, uh, strengths, and so on. So ideally, I think uh, the actual placement, Vinay is going to talk a little later on. So in India, our experience has been predominantly with the Nagi stent because this was the only one available till recently, till uh, the Boston came up with the Axios stent, which is now available here. But it also cost factor was not so high, so therefore a lot of Indians started using this. And then, of course, there came the concept of using with endoscopic ultrasound. So because this stent was initially designed for side wing scopy, it took some uh, practice for endosonologists to use this stent to get used to it. Because you can see in endosonology, when you're using it through the US scope, uh, the luminal part is blind. So sometimes there's a potential chance of misplacing the stent inside. So we have to be very careful in pulling it out. And the last part, watching it uh, through the scope so that you put it in accurately. And over a period of time, of course, it becomes very easy to do this uh, procedure. Uh, and you can see that it was fairly dramatic, the large uh, bond here. And after four weeks, the whole thing is drained off completely. Uh, one of the first reports outside India came from Japan, uh, which was Amamato's uh, group who actually used this in a series of patients. Uh, so in Japan, after India, the most commonly used place was in Japan, followed by other Asian countries, including uh, Australia. Uh, it was actually Mukai and Natal again in Japan who pointed out the difference between the so-called lumen opposing stents, which is the axial stent, versus uh, the biflanged metal stent, which was the Nagi stent. Uh, the concept was totally different. Uh, the migration rate you see with the lumen opposing stent is much less compared to Nagi stent, but our concept is migration should occur. So when what we mean by migration is when the stent, the cavity collapses, the stent shouldn't push against the opposite wall. It should fall off into the stomach. Or when you're doing an actual necrosectomy, it can actually fall off, but you can replace it at the same time. So this was the flexibility of what we created this stent, that we wanted a stent which wouldn't oppose the wall so that it shouldn't rub against the opposite wall because that can have consequences and it should drop into the stomach spontaneously. So therefore, although at that time migration was thought to be an adverse event, it was actually more often uh, uh, not that. Uh, um, Mukai pointed out that the advantage of the Nagi stent was the stem, which was a little longer, 20 to 30, versus a shorter stem with the axial stent. And that's because it's the axial stent, you have to place it very accurately. Of course, once you become an expert, it becomes easy. The delivery system was much easier for, for us endoscopists doing ERCP because it's exactly like putting in a, a biliary stent. And of course, finally, the incidence of bleed was much less with Nagi stent because the concept was to have very smooth plates and most of the time the stent drops off uh, after a certain period of time. Uh, the, the first multicentric trial with Nagi stent was reported by Amol and his group along with some Japanese colleagues uh, when they actually looked at 21 patients uh, with pancreatic fluid collections with a very high technical and clinical success rates with no adverse uh, uh, reaction in these patients. They, again, complication is main, uh, uh, send migration was very little in these patients and hemorrhage, of course, is not very common in Nagi stent. The, the first uh, series which actually compared this stent along with the plastic stents, again, came from Japan, from Mukai's group. Uh, the majority of the metal stents in this group was actually the Nagi stent with few axial stents, but they compared it plastic stents. And uh, what they found was the only main difference was that the time for intervention was uh, much less with this uh, stent compared to plastic stents. And this was one of the advantages that Subsequently, in 2018, the Italian group uh, actually published a large uh, multicentric uh, study. More than 67 um, stents, Nagi stents were used in this group. Majority of them transduodenal. Again, uh, transduodenal is much transgastric. Sorry, transgastric is much easier than, than to use transduodenal. 
And what they did is you can see they used a 19 gauge uh, needle or a sister stone. We have been using the sister stone quite a lot because we find that makes it much easier. Uh, sometimes the wall is soft, you can use directly or very often you require a four millimeter balloon. Again, this is something that I think uh, Vinay is going to talk on, so I won't go. But the technical success is very high with these tents. And this is very important. This is what we're emphasizing. With this tent, we do not advocate direct endoscopy necrosectomy. Only a very small percentage, only about 10% will actually ultimately require direct necrosectomy with the Nagi stent. Uh, of the adverse reactions, again, you can see that bleeding is very less. In fact, in their series was zero. This is the difference between Nagi stent and other stents, uh, both SPACs uh, and also the Axis stent. I think the reason is that uh, this stent, the flaps are very soft and because it's a two centimeter uh, stem, it tends to move up and down though, so that when the wall comes in it against, it moves towards the stomach. And very often the migration of the stent is uh, into the, you can see 7.5 migration, usually it's 10% in most series, the migration is into the stomach. Uh, there have been, uh, at that point of time, many stents, but you can see predominantly most of them were using Axios. Few were using Nagi, mainly this was uh, from Japan and from Australia, a large series from Australia was also reported with the Nagi stent, but predominantly in the Western world, in Europe, Nagi was available after it got registered, but uh, it, it was not available in, in, uh, uh, in the United States, so still not available. The other thing they did with uh, Tevung did, uh, I don't know whether right or wrong, is they haven't, they didn't patent the stent. So it's non patented and anybody could actually copy this stent. Uh, how does this stent compare with other uh, stents which are for pancreatic fluid collections now in the market? There are, there is um, one um, bench study and one clinical study. The bench study was by uh, Anthony Theo and his group from Hong Kong, who clearly showed that um, if you look at the strength of the stent, the tissue opposing strength of the strength of the stents, the best would be the axial stent followed by spaxis. Now, the Nagi stent has got an extremely low opposing lumen opposing uh, activity, and this again is what the stent was designed for. This is not a lumen opposing stent. It's a biflange stent, which is very specific to pancreatic fluids. And because it doesn't have the lumen opposing capacity, it's not an ideal stent for gastrojejunostomy uh, or a gastrogastric anastomosis and so on. Uh, so the clinical study comparing uh, this uh, Nagi stent along with uh, the Axios stent was done in a study which again uh, came from Europe. And they, you can see clearly that uh, there's not so much of a difference between these two except that a little higher migration late occurs with uh, Nagi stent. Again, not very significant. Uh, so this, this particular study where they compared this uh, Nagi with lumen opposing stent showed that there was not much difference between both the stent. Again, our concept was this is a stent that should be used to drain the fluid and we should actually avoid the necrosectomy as much as possible. So based on this, we actually did a study where we looked up uh, whether we can do an endoscopic step-up approach instead of going for direct necrosectomy using the Nagi stent. And uh, this is a study that was published in GIE sometime back where we took uh, 375 patients who underwent endoscopic drainage. Majority were using, were using this, um, this special Nagi stent. Plastic stent was used in some cases where there was a gross disruption of the pancreatic duct where the stents had to be kept for a long period of time. So what we did was after initial assessment, uh, some of them improved those with persistent symptoms, or especially majority of them had an infected one, were drained. And uh, what we found was that out of 153 cases that were drained, 49 required re-intervention. And the re-intervention was very early if there's a clogging of the stent and we could do declogging with endoscope. Or sometimes uh, if there was uh, still persistent uh, non-clinical success, then we put a nasocystic tube and uh, if still it continued to be a problem, usually about the second week, then we do a direct endoscopic necrosectomy, which was only 11% of our patients. And this was the concept of the Nagi stent. That it's a, one of the problems with this stent is getting blocked here. And we have actually now we have overcome this. And what we're doing is routinely we put a double pigtail seven front stent through the Nagi stent. And we find that this complication of clogging is much less. And so also the migration. If there's still fever not responding, we put an NCT with irrigation, sometimes with hydrogen peroxide. And in a small percentage of cases, about 10%, we actually do a direct necrosectomy. Uh, so this is, this is the final figure showing that majority of the cases can be treated without necrosectomy, a very small percentage require this. 
Of course, there can be complications and we learned uh, using this Nagy stent over a period of time that the complications can be overcome. For example, bleeding uh, can be overcome. The incidence of bleeding is very less with Nagy stent, but even that small incidence can be overcome by early removal. And this is thanks to based on some very good work by Vinay probably show that, that if we remove the stent by about three weeks or four weeks, then chance of bleeding is very less. Migration can be avoided for, by putting a double pigtail stents. Perforation, of course, can be avoided by choosing the right type of case. Uh, and because the stem is a little longer, the chance of perforation is very less. And if the stent gets into the mucosa, we use, often use an APC to take out the stent. Uh, if the stent is mal deployed, and this is one advantage of Nagi stent, the stent is mal deployed. Unlike other stents, you can actually pick it up, reload it, and use it again. Or actually, once it goes inside, you can use the lasso, pick it back, and put it back in the right shape, like we use for completely covered stents. And this is one of the advantages we had. Now, we have also seen that using the stent, the recurrent rates depends upon uh, the type of uh, the disconnected pancreatic duct, and this is from paper from Vinay, which probably will be showing later on. Uh, and he also showed that early removal of these stents were resulted in less bleed, and we actually predict which patients would recur. For example, if we had a patient um, whose chance of recurrence was this, then we put a plastic stent in this case, not a Nagy stent. And this is some very useful information that we got. This stent has also been used in other situations. For example, uh, although we don't advocate it very strongly, this is a study which came from Hong Kong. Uh, and you can see that they've used this stent in a patient uh, with uh, peripancreatic fluid collection after surgery. So this is, again, something that we are used very often. Post-surgical peripancreatic fluid collections are a basis we use. Uh, there's been reports of using this stent from Australia in malignant ascites, although we won't advocate that. Uh, stent also has been used in afferent loop syndrome. This is a paper from uh, Sudipta Dar from CMC Velu, where they have used it in afferent loop syndrome. There have been subsequently many papers, although classically it's uh, axial stent which have been used in afferent loop syndrome. Even the Nagy stent can be used very successfully. And this was uh, a, a patient of ours who had a very large afferent loop syndrome. And you can see that uh, the stent has been very effective. Uh, this is something we won't advocate with Nagy stent, but reports have come of using this with gallbladder drainage. As I said, this is not a lumen opposing stent. If you have a patient who's got a very chronic cholestatis, the gallbladder is stuck to the duodenum, you can get away by using this, but generally we won't advocate this stent for gallbladder drainage. Uh, although you can use it for pelvic abscess. Uh, this is a report which came from France, from uh, Mark Giovanni group, and they used this stent in a patient with uh, pelvic abscesses, and they showed quite, uh, that it was quite effective. Uh, so what is going to be the future now? Based on this, uh, the actual stent and the Nagi stent, there are many hybrid stents that are being developed. And I think uh, you also have Moon here, uh, there with us. Uh, we're going to talk later on the type of stents, Paxos stent. But this is a hybrid stent uh, which came from Hanero's, Hanero company, where they combined the axial stent with Nagi stent. So you can see that uh, what they're having is a, a flap which turns back, which is partly tissue opposing, but very important, they have this uh, longer stem. So this stent is a combination of both. It's a very stiff stent, a combination of Nagi and Axia stent. And they believe in a report that they just published uh, recently that this stent may be quite uh, the future of combining both the stents. I think many more innovations are going to come in this area. In fact, at that in, in, 19, in 2015, we proposed this uh, combined stent where you have a needle, a balloon to mildly dilate the tract and then go inside directly, especially if the tract is very tough and you can, just using cautery may not be sufficient. Uh, this is still not developed because uh, the hot axis came and then of course we now have the hot Nagi stent which is made by Tevung, it's registered now uh, for commercial sale. It's available in, uh, I think, Korea, but we've been using this now and we've reported a series where we use it just like uh, axial stent. So one of the important things from these innovations is that each of the innovation is taking uh, help from the other innovation to make it better to make it much easier. And then you can see the Nagi stent is just like Axios. The stent is similar, but the delivery system makes it a little more easier to use. Uh, so I think the indication as I can look at these specific stents are increasing, not only walled off necrosis, but I think with stents like Axios, which I think is a brilliant stent actually. Uh, you can do gastrojejunostomies, you can treat benign strictures, you can also do gallbladder drainage and also create fistulas, but you can also drain a lot of abscess. So they, the horizon of indications has markedly increased using these uh, stents. Uh, and you can see this uh, 
that our uh, imagination is only limitation here. I think uh, these tents, which are a completely different uh, type of tents when compared to a standard uh, um, billary or pancreatic uh, metal tents, are uh, game changers in the sense that uh, for cavities which are very close, which have to be drained, these are the stents that we are going to look for. And I'm sure in future, there are going to be many, many more innovations in these types of stents. Some of these stents are going to be used for drug delivery. Some of these stents are going to be used for obesity for, and so on. And already we have actually used the uh, edge of the Nagi stent to make a, a sleeve, a duodenal jejunal sleeve for type 2 diabetes. So I think a lot of other innovations are going to come. I'm sure we can look forward to this uh, in future. Again, I'd like to thank AEG, especially Vinay and Lawrence for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nagi. Really nice uh, lecture uh, from the authority, <laughs> inventor of Nagi stand. Uh, perhaps I, I, I have a few questions from the audience. Uh, if there's any other questions, um, can you all just uh, type it into the Q&A so that we do not lose the questions. So everyone is uh, welcome to type in their questions uh, into the Q&A, then I will try to, to uh, get the answers uh, live from the speakers themselves. Just, just very quickly before I uh, ask the questions from the audience, uh, just one thing. I think you mentioned that uh, the Nagi stand is actually not supposed to be a lumen opposing stand, isn't it? So yes, what do you yes, think yes. are the, the use cases, I think the ideal use cases for, for Nagi stand? Yeah, so... Uh, fluid the, collection, any other, any other use, uh, good use cases for this sort of stand? So because this is uh, not uh, a lumen opposing stent, typically it should not be used uh, in a situation where the, uh, the organs are moving. For example, stomach and gallbladder, they tend to move with respiration and this stent will get dislodged. So ideal is to use it in areas where there's a fixity between uh, the two lumens, for example, like a worn base already formed. So therefore, Nagi stent, we would not recommend for early one. We have to wait for four weeks. All the access has been used used for second week or third week. I wouldn't recommend that for Nagi stent. For pelvic abscess or any other abdominal abscess which have to be drained, it could still be used very well because most of them are chronic and they are fixed structures. So therefore it's very used. Also, this is something that should not be used for gastro -jejunostomy. I've seen people actually trying to use this for gastro -jejunostomy. This is going to be a disaster because, because of peristalsis, the walls are going to move and this does not fix it. So the advantage of this stent, as I said, is that there is this movement of the stent which can occur so that uh, you don't get into problem in terms of the opposite wall hitting. And this also is a disadvantage because you can't use it in other situations. Uh, again, I think because this is a very long stem, the chance of tissue ischemia is very less with this. Stem. Okay. I think you did mention that there's a reduced uh, bleeding with the stent. Is that because yeah. uh, I think uh, the stent actually migrated out before you have the yes. chance to, to get bleeding? Okay. So, so uh, can, can I just uh, ask, uh, there's a question from the audience uh, asking, how can we manage perforation of one wall during necrostectomy? I think this is not specific to your stand, but again, I think it's something which is useful, especially very, which is important, especially when you are putting a stent in. How do you manage yeah. it? So this, I think there's so many other experts also here, yet they can also add in probably. But uh, generally when there's uh, the perforation, recognize it immediately. The important thing would be that uh, with all these stents, you can put, finish the procedure. And what we would often do is to put in an additional double pigtail stent in the main stent so that the stent doesn't get dislodged. Uh, whereas this is a little different from what happens with, say, axial stent. If you put the axial stent, a perforation occurs, then uh, this may mean that very often you have to go for surgery uh, because this is fixed to the gastric wall, you can't manipulate. Whereas with Nagi stent, you can actually get it in a little deeper in the other side and then put in a double pigtail stent. But of course, the surgeon should be on hand, should know what's happening. Uh, if its contents are uh, like an infected fluid, you have to be careful because I think early surgery in this case is very important. Okay. Uh, the next question, is, uh, I think relating to this is, uh, what is the... Yeah. What, should, distance. what should be the minimum distance of the pancreatic wall from the gastric wall in order for you to place the Nagi stent uh, safely? So the general rule is when you're using this stent is uh, so one centimeter is what is like generally recommended. But in Nagi stent, because we have two centimeters and we also have three, uh, three CM Nagi stent, you can actually go up to two. The maximum is two centimeters, not more than that. But usually one is what we normally take. One centimeter or less 
is ideal, but you can extend up to two because of the stem, which is much larger. Again, this is different from you from lumen opposing stent, which is it's very important that to limit it to one centimeter or less. Okay. Uh, yeah. This is one last one before I switch over because some of the questions can be also answered uh, a bit later on uh, when Rene comes on because uh, yeah. I think there are more technical issues. But this one is regarding the the follow up. I think the question is uh, how do you follow this patient and uh, and to know whether the the stand is clotted. I'm talking about blocking. I think so. So how do you actually look at it? Do you need to rescope or? Or when, when, when do you rescope and then if it's indeed blocked, do you actually, what do you do to, to unblock it or replace it? So normally what we do is a clinical follow-up in these patients. Generally when the stent gets blocked, so this, uh, this stent's what we do, normally do without putting a stent, we do an endoscope, we do an ultrasound, plain for abdominal ultrasound after three days, after one week, and again after one month. So the patient is asymptomatic, there's nothing if the, the size of the, uh, lumen is decreasing, then we don't do anything. We don't actually stand, we don't endoscope this patient. But if uh, the patient develops clinical symptoms, fever, abdominal pain, and so on, then we go in endoscopically. Usually this happens within the first 48 hours if the stent is clogged because of necrotic material. We can then declog this endoscopically only, uh, completely. And now what we're doing is routinely putting a double pigtail seven French stent, seven French, seven French stent, uh, seven centimeter seven French stents, and we find that this prevents uh, markedly the stent uh, uh, clogging. Uh, so, if the patient is again symptomatic, it could be either because the stent getting blocked, which can clear, or it can be a migration, early migration stent, which could be easily replaced. In fact, now uh, salvage Nagi stent is very common in our unit. We use the same stent, which can be used in this patient, and sometimes if it is more than one week, then you can actually push the stent through the opening directly by stretching this stent, or you can reload it and then put it again. So this is uh, sometimes done. If the patient still is symptomatic, uh, the size of the cavity is not coming down, especially the fever is a predominant component, then we use a nasocystic tube in these cases. Usually this is done after one week, nasocystic tube to clear the stent. Uh, so this is how we clinically follow. So clinically only, uh, only follow uh, symptoms of the patient and ultrasound, ultrasound, abdominal ultrasound. Only if they're symptomatic, the size of the cavity not decreasing symptomatic, then we do an ultrasound. Just talk about just US. So I will ask uh, Nagi, Vinay, if you don't mind, and then after that I come to you. Okay. So this one is on uh, the use of Nagi stand in uh, esophageal stricture. Uh, so, the question is whether this so is. So this is this, this is, is the question asked. The indication. Yeah, off-label, but yeah, I don't, I, we won't advocate use of Nagi stent in esophageal stricture, although the axial stent has been used in esophageal strictures, in pyloric strictures, because that is lumen opposing, it's okay. It can be, although, you know, actually it's not so easy to use even axials with an upper GS scope. It's very easy to use it with a, an US scope, but not so easy with upper GS scope because your control is not so good. But uh, Nagi stent uh, is not, should not be used for esophageal strictures. Okay, so there are lots of questions. Sorry, I think we run out of time. <laughs> I'll try to get some of the questions answered by Vinay. Otherwise, I think, thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. I have thank a, okay, I'll go on to the next one. Um, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing uh, our next speaker, who is actually the organizer of this uh, webinar, uh, Vinay Dale. He's going to, uh, he's an EUS guy. So I think uh, it's very appropriate for him to share with us all the intricacies, the tips and uh, and also the pitfalls of uh, using the Nagi stand in doing uh, the various EUS uh, guided therapy. So I think Vinay, please. Yeah, hi. So we hired um, from Nagi, um, fantastic uh, lecture and all the background and the studies have been given by uh, uh, Nagi. So what I will... Uh, and um, so it will be a very very practical uh, talk on how uh, we have been using the Nagi stent at uh, our department. We have been using it for almost a decade now, and we um, have become a little wiser. So this um, video is just to show you the date. This is fifth of March two thousand eleven. So Nagi probably it was a prototype <laughs> which we placed. <laughs> 
So uh, this is uh, our probably the first na nagi that we placed, and it is almost a decade. And if you see the steps, see 19 gauge needle, passage of wire, sister tome, then CRE balloon. <clears throat> So we borrowed lots of ideas from the um, previous pseudo drainage and worn drainage experiences and we applied them here and so this is our uh, initial way of doing nagi uh, stents and over the past 10 years the basics have remained the same although there have been certain modifications as we have become more sorry uh, more knowledgeable about the problems and other things. So before I start on this, uh, what is very important for us is to assess the cyst or the pseudocyst or the worn. Um, does the patient really need drainage? Who are the patients who need drainage? Those who have a large collection which is causing symptoms or those who have an infected collection. So these are the two indications almost 30 to 35 percent of patients who come to me for drainage, I say no. I say please follow up, these patients don't need a drainage. So first and foremost is to ascertain does the patient need a drainage because every procedure has potential of adverse events and you should not be causing adverse events in patients who really do not need drainage. The second question you should ask is the uh, this uh, fluid collection or pseudocyst suitable for EUS guided drainage. So how do you determine that? You have to see on CT scan or MRI that there are well-defined walls. So the walls should not be broken. There should not be fluid tracking into multiple areas. The collection should be close to the stomach or duodenum, as Nagi mentioned, about one centimeter. Um, how much is the necrotic material within the collection? So MRI gives you a fair idea of that. Um, because that um, you should decide beforehand whether this patient is going to need some necrosectomy or you can get away without a necrosectomy. And then what is the size? So whether the patient needs an endotracheal intubation uh, before the... So we do not do endotracheal intubation in all our patients, but if a patient has a large collection and we expect the contents to come up into the mouth, then of course... Uh, we um, do endotracheal intubation. So these are some of the basics we need to know before we uh, start the procedure. It is extremely important that when you put in your EUS scope, you assess again, spend some time on looking at the collection. What is the distance from the stomach and duodenal wall? Are there really collaterals in the puncture trajectory? Very, very important because very often these patients have uh, thrombosis uh, either of the splenic vein or some other veins and then you will find many vessels around the fluid uh, collection. So please uh, um, I will show you please show that see that there are no collaterals in the trajectory of the puncture if there are choose a different site for the puncture. Then also assess what is the amount of necrotic debris that is there uh, and whether there will be any further need for necrosectomy. You should be ready with all the accessories that you have, a 19 gauge needle, 0 0.035. We use a stiff guide wire, a six French sister tome. Uh, we use a six mm um, biliary balloon nowadays. We used to use CRE before, but six mm uh, uh, dilator, then of course Nagi stent and also keep some plastic stents uh, with you. So be ready with the accessories um, and then start. So this, according to me, is the most important part of your, um, uh, your entire um, Nagi stent placement, and that is a careful cyst evaluation. So this is a patient I did today morning. And so I quickly made a video and I'm showing you. Uh, so you see here, very nice uh, collection, but you should withdraw your scope slowly over the entire edge of the fluid collection and see if there are any vessels. See, I'm now withdrawing my scope slowly, looking at the entire collection, looking at whether there is a debris or not. In one view, you may not find, but if you change your angle a bit, see here, you will start seeing that there is debris here.
this looks like a scary vessel but it is not so all these things are important and then of course apply doppler in the entire cyst area and especially in the gastric wall and in your puncture trajectory so your puncture is going to come from here so you have to be very careful in this axis as if there are any vessels or not so carefully evaluate the entire cyst you will see at the words to the junction you see vessels have started appearing you see there these are the vessels see this now if i puncture from here i am increasing the chance of bleeding so avoid this area don't puncture from here so these are important things spend some time before you really so as i coming as i'm coming proximal you are seeing more and more vessels here so this is a dangerous area and also you see the distance of the cyst from the stomach wall is going on increasing so this is not the nice place we have to go in and carefully see it's also a good practice to we go up tip your scope a bit so that the gastric wall is a little relaxed then you can see intragastric collaterals you see here there are small small intragastric collaterals here uh, so this uh, evaluation you need to see the distance so we are measuring the distance now and the collaterals so you can see obviously this cyst is not compressing on the stomach wall it's a bit away but the distance is 7 mm so this is about okay we can proceed and we have to now find an area where there are no vessels no major vessels which are likely to bleed so you see i am going distal now i i am already expecting that when i puncture there might be some bleeding looking at the vessels that are there but i am trying to now go toward this area where there are probably less vessels and i can puncture from there so this assessment is very important this cyst is large you see this is about 9 by 12 cm fluid collection so i have already requested my anesthetist beforehand to put in an endotracheal tube so that there is no aspiration after the procedure Yet is finished. So these are some of the important things because after the procedure, a gush of fluid comes out, and then you have aspiration that can be really, really uh, dangerous. But not all patients need um, endotracheal intubation. So this is a, about the cyst evaluation. You also saw the wall of the fluid collection was very well defined. So we didn't see any tracking of the fluid anywhere. So this looks like a good cyst puncture. Needle puncture is straightforward. Those of you who are doing um, uh, U.S. guided biopsy know that. Only thing is, most of the times you will puncture in a corner. You know, we would like to go here, but it doesn't happen because of the peculiarities of the U.S. scope. So this is another patient, not the same patient. You see here. Same things are being done. You are assessing the wall. You are assessing the distance from the stomach wall, and then see the puncture usually comes in this angle. It doesn't come in the center. And once you have punctured, you pass your wire and make about one and a half coils. Use a stiff wire, O3 five inch. Uh, don't use a soft wire. So see, this is being coiled here. About one and a half coils is good enough. And that's about it. This is a simple uh, thing: needle puncture and wire passage. Uh, here, what is most important is for you to realize that once you have got a good position to puncture, uh, you have to learn to stabilize your scope. That is the single most important thing. Because if I have passed my wire here and I dilate here. And then suppose my scope has moved up a little, about a centimeter, then the stent will come like this, and it will not puncture. So keep the position very important. And how do you know that you are keeping the position on EUS at all times? You should see the wire at all times. If you are seeing the wire at all times, you are safe. There is no problem. Your axis is good. You can go on doing. the various steps
Track dilation, uh, again, a very straightforward uh, thing. Uh, you don't have to do much. If you are seeing the wire here, I'm showing you the biliary balloon. You can see the two lines here. So this is the biliary balloon. This is the case I did today. So I have just took the liberty of uh, taking some video for you. Normally, I don't put contrast in my balloon. This is just for so you dilate it nicely, six millimeters. That is usually enough. Um, sometimes you find difficulty in knowing where the balloon is. So you go by the markers. It's exactly like ERCP. It will tell you where the gastric wall. It's a fairly straightforward procedure. Sometimes I have seen in conferences, not experienced myself, following dilatation, there can be a gush of bleed. Um, that usually happens with the CRE balloon. So we have stopped using a CRE balloon. But if it, it is there, don't worry. You already have a wire inside. You quickly place a stent. It will mostly stop the bleeding. So not to worry about that. A stent placement. So you see this is the wire here. I'll go through this quickly. So you have pushed your stent in. And then you ask your assistant to deploy the stent. So slowly. So you see here, this is the distal flange. So we are pulling it a bit up. There is a middle mark here, which you should always keep close to the gastric wall. If you don't do that, then there can be problems. So you see here, sorry, this, this is again made today, very fast video. And then keep the wire in place and place a seven French, as Nagi was telling you, place a seven French double pigtail stand through this. So this patient, did have hemorrhagic fluid coming out today. So we are observing him because this patient has portal hypertension. So the steps that you have to remember in stent placement is um, you have to deploy the stent in the scope. The final part of the stent has to be deployed in the scope. That is number one. Concentrate on the middle marker of the Nagi stent. If you keep the middle marker close to the gastric wall and then most probably you will not uh, make mistake. We have tried doing it full EUS, we have tried doing it with, with fluoro but as uh, Nagi told you the best way to do it is you may find it really difficult but try to see the last part deployed under your endoscope, that is the safest way of doing it. What about hot nagi? Hot nagi patient. Now you just use the nagi stent. So it has a cautery at the tip. You see, this is a cautery. You have gone in. You can actually do it without wire also, but initially it is safer to do. See here, this is the middle marker. Keep it close to the stomach wall and then gently withdraw. Ask your assistant to withdraw the thing. See here, it is opening. Slow, careful movement. There is no hurry. So now it's a beautiful, uh, beautifully uh, deployed distal flange. Once you have done this, shift to endoscopy. So you shift to endoscopy and see the stent. See, this is the proximal part of the stent, slowly being deployed. And this is a beautifully deployed hot nagi stent. So you see we have not needed dilatation in this uh, hot nagi stent. We may not need wire placement also, but right now it is new. So we want to be safe like we did with Axios. So we still like to use a wire before you place a hot uh, nagi stent. So this reduces the steps. If you need Later on to do a necrosectomy, um, it's fairly easy. Um, so these are the standard things, I'll go through it. So now you here see, Nagi also showed you these things. So uh, yeah, there are multiple things, it's a little tedious process, but you can do it carefully and bring out large chunks of necrotic material. See, this is dirty fluid coming out. Uh, you can use hydrogen peroxide to clean it and make it a little loose and then clean it. So needs a long time, needs a lot of patience, but those patients in whom it is required, it has to be done. Uh, and uh, if you place a plastic stent initially, uh, the incidence of your doing necrosectomy really comes down 
because the debris blocking the mouth of the stent is avoided. So necrosectomy can be done safely through the Nagi stent. If the stent comes out, there is nothing to worry. You can replace it without a problem. Yeah. So this is, if you do it with a lot of patience, at the end of it, you will, <laughs> this is too much of necrosis at one go. And so what I do is I push my scope against the mouth of the stent so that it doesn't fall out. Uh, but sometimes it does fall out. So not to worry, you can replace it. And that is something I like about the Nagi stent is its flexibility. Um, it reduces the chances of severe problems. And then you can hope to get a cavity like this, which is fairly clean. You can see here, it's a very, very clean cavity now. It's a very large collection. So this is for necrosectomy. Um, stent migrated during deployment it does happen so please don't get worried if it gets migrated during deployment there are ways to deal with it and these are not dif difficult ways suppose when you are deploying the stent and the stent completely goes inside what do you do absolutely not to worry you can place another nagi or you can place two plastic stents and then call the patient after three weeks go inside the cavity and pull the nagi stent out it's absolutely no problems. If the uh, stent has migrated outside into the stomach, then it's even easier. You can place the stent very easily again, the same stent you can place again. But you have to always remember, please retain the guide wire till you are satisfied, uh, satisfied with the stent position. If you have lost the guide wire, then there is a problem. So retain the guide wire, see that you are happy with the stent position, good fluid is coming out, then only withdraw your guide wire. As long as you have the guide wire, you are safe. So this is, you see here, these are only pictures, I don't have a video. So this is from the duodenum. We placed a Nagi stent and it migrated completely within the cavity. So we just placed a fully after about three weeks, we went in and removed this Nagi stent. So this is problematic at that time. You feel, oh, you lost a Nagi stent, but uh, can be recovered. Patient mostly will not have any major issue. I think that is my last slide. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Vinay. Yeah, lots of questions. But I don't think we have the time because I think uh, we are running a bit short. So maybe I think uh, two questions. Um, relating to the, uh, the practical tips. And uh, one uh, question is on, uh, do you have any tip or trick for drainage of worn with a lot of solid material? It makes the procedure uh, difficult to do, even with the Nagi inside. Yes, it is, it is, it is a challenge and this is a very, very good question. So, uh, uh, as I said, you have to assess all these things before you place a step. So uh, assess the amount of debris that is there. Um, I will do um, uh, endoscopic necrosectomy up to about 50%. So if you have half fluid and half debris, I am okay with it. But if it is 80% debris and 20% fluid, I would probably avoid and call my surgeon. That is my personal opinion. There is no data to show that. Um, but I I, pref I would say it becomes too much work. The chances of complication probably increase with multiple necrosectomies. So half or less than half of the volume of the uh, cyst, if it is debris, then uh, in two to three sessions, you can remove it. And also try to avoid initially. And as Nagi said, and as AIG has shown in majority of cases, maybe you don't need a necrosectomy. So if uh, necrosectomy can be avoided, very good. If it has to be done, assessment in the beginning is very important. It is a full system of uh, full of debris. I will probably say no. I will not do it. Nagi, what is what is your? Yeah. Uh, Absolutely agree with this, Vinay. I think fifty percent is the cutoff we take. If it is uh, less than fifty percent, success is very high. But if it is more than seventy-five percent, immediately you no, know, we just send off a surgeon. Uh, between fifty to seventy-five is a gray zone, but I think uh, we prefer more fluid. If it's 50% more fluid, then it's much easier. Absolutely yeah, same thing. What do you do? Which one? Not, not hearing me. 
Okay, so another question, actually this was asked by two people. Okay, yeah. so they, they asked something relating to, to, to warn war of necrosis. So what is the percentage of necrosis uh, in a warn before you decide to, to drain it? Is there a cutoff in terms of percent? So we just discussed that. I think uh, it's the same that what is the solid debris. See, fine debris is okay. If you saw the first case that I showed, today morning's case, that has fine debris. So I'm not too bothered. I'm more bothered about bleeding in that case. But the necrosectomy case that I showed, beforehand only uh, we know that this person will probably need a necrosectomy. We are very happy with 30%, 40%, 50%, but more than 50, I personally try to avoid and not uh, go for uh, necrosectomy. Okay, good. Just as very quickly, uh, which uh, biliary dilator do you normally use? If you choose a biliary dilator? The hurricane. I use the hurricane. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, so we are going to move on. I think, Vinay, you are going to take over the, the chairing, isn't it? <laughs> no, I, I think uh, Lazaro is here. Lazaro, can you please um, uh, yes, announce, uh, yeah, can you please introduce Professor Moon? Uh, the next speaker is the Dr. Young Hu Moon. Uh, uh, he's going to talk about uh, to talk about the idea, development, and future about the spark system. Thank you, Dr. Moon. You can begin, please. Welcome, Moon. Welcome and thank you very much for agreeing to be part of this uh, webinar. We are really honored. So we want to hear from you your ideas of about spec system. Pinai? Pinai? We can hear you, John. We, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. It's my great honor to join this fantastic meeting, especially thanks to Pinai and Asian US group. Everybody knows the stenting with conventional metal stent is the insertion of a stent through the structural segment in organ by percutaneous or endoscopic approach. Like this figure, very familiar to us to make uh, that kind of stenting. But their stenting with lumen opposing metal stent is the insertion of a stent through the non structured two organs to connecting two organs by a metal stent by endoscopy. So it can make uh, uh, many problems. So we need a completely different design stent to make her, to prevent a kind of uh, issues. So actual stent was the first luminal opposing metal stent by Boston Scientific, but originally by Kim, uh, our friend, by Dr. Ken B. Muller and ex Lumina of the United States. So after development of this stent, Ken became the gl glorious emperor of interventional US world. Its own very specialized, very useful delivery system and deployment. So I think Ken is the genius developed the kind of system. So all procedure of stenting can be done by operator himself. So Ken made a Many assistants got laid off after development of Axios. With the lamps, not only by drainage, we can make her access route for possible transluminal traveling into the target organ. So it's the evolution of metal stand. Also, the indications of US guide drainage can be expanded uh, with lamps. The first clinical result can be re re was reported by Dr. Itoi and B. Muller 
And after then, uh, we have a lot of results of Axios from large scale the multi center study from uh, European countries and also United States. However, still we have some challenging points of actions like this. This is a, a new luminal project metal stand, a spacious. It has a 25 millimeter large anchoring flange, and the, the length of stand is 20 millimeter. After complete folding back of that kind of large anchoring flanges, the this distance of two flanges is just a seven millimeter. So our team and uh, Taewoo Medical of Korea developed uh, this stand. It is the first drawing to suggest a company uh, to make uh, the kind of uh, new stand. So it's on just a conventional, 10 French conventional uh, delivery system, not on specialized delivery system. This animation shows the deployment of spacious on conventional delivery system. So the kind of deployment is much different with Axios. Just very familiar with like a routine conventional metal stand. Already this slide showed by uh, Nagi. Anthony compared the US specific metal stand on different types of anastomosis. Axios and spacious shows a higher Lumen opposing force, but the axios was the highest lumen opposing forces. And spacious has some advantages comparing with other stands, like it has a long length of stand, but the, the dis distances between two flanges is very short. It's a seven millimeter. It can make an easy procedure. So another advantage is it can make a accommodable apposition according to world thickness of anastomosis, like this. This video shows a successful recapturing of spacious even after complete deployment of distal flange. Another advantage is it has a certain kind of stand diameter uh, for the purpose of drainage, like a drainage of oldum necrosis or gallbladder and CDS. Our group reported the first clinical result of US guide drainage using uh, spacious and following Korean multicenter study and Asian multicenter studies results shows a high technical and clinical success rate and very acceptable adverse event rate. Let me show some cases. This patient performed the US guide drainage using spacious in 60 millimeter for the drainage of one after puncturing, stand distal flange is deployed. And then endoscopy view shows the deployment of proximal flange. And you can see the drainage of fluid contents from one. With inside of stand, now gastroscope is inserting inside the necrotic cavity to make a necrosectomy using many weapons, snare and forceps. We should use every, every uh, accessories to make a clean cavity. And finally, you can see the pinkish background. It means of regenerating back wall and almost complete necrosectomy was done through the spacious. And this video shows the US guided gallbladder drainage. The procedure is same, puncturing and inserting spacious into the cavity. Distal flange was deployed on US and floral. And then proximal flange deployed on endoscopy you could see the gosha prolonged bile from the gallbladder. And gastroscope is inserting inside the gallbladder through the spacious immediately. Now you can see the surface of gallbladder and we can perform white light image and MBI. Also, 
For this patient supporting acute suppurative cholecystitis after stent in introduction with spacious in 10 millimeter, now gastroscope inserting inside the gallbladder and on direct visualization, stone can be removed with basket like this, make a removal of all gallstone in from inside the gallbladder. This case shows US guided cholecystitis diadenostomy with spacious in eight millimeter in diameter after puncturing the distal flange is deployed on EUS, and then proximal flange deployed on endoscopy. After deployment of spacious, ultra slim scope is inserting into the deep portion of bile duct for some kind of intervention through the spacious. Recent development for luminal opposing metal stent is uh, one step puncturing and stenting using introducer system capable of electrocautery catheter. With that kind of new development, most critical track allocation step can be skipped on EUS guided drainage. Can develop one step EUS guided drainage using hot axios having electrocautery enhanced delivery system. With the development now, can became God of our world. Especially the result of US guided gastrogenostomy markedly improved with hot axios. Also, spacious stand has cautery ena enabled Access catheter for one step US guided drainage. This animation shows a deployment of hot. After puncturing a world of necrosis with 19 gauge needle, and now hot species is penetrating the gastric wall without any tract dilatation. And now this flange is deployed. And then proximal stent is deployed in working channel. Now we developed a spacious version too. It has a shorter length and then small anchoring flange to make a high apposition power. Amazingly, it's on nine French delivery system, so it can make a more easier penetration. Let me show this case. This case, this patient have a inaccessible ampulla by infiltrating a pancreatic cancer. After puncturing a bile duct, Spacious to introduced in bile duct without tract dilatation. It's a nine French delivery system. After deployment of distal flange, and then proximal flange is deployed, and finally CDS is made. We are also developing new bipolar electrocautery enhanced delivery system to reducing tissue damage by electrocauterization and also no need of return electro, electro, electrode plate. This video shows a US guided gold rate drainage on animal study using 16 millimeter spacious on bipolar electrocautery enhanced delivery system. After penetration into the gallbladder, 
now distal flange is deployed. And then proximal flange is deployed. You can see the gaussian of the content of gallbladder. Comparable gastrostomy is the creation of new fistula between upper stomach and left intrahepatic duct. So it has uh, several issues for US guided hepatic gastrostomy. Especially fatal stent migration was reported after US HGS. So we developed new special HGS having 20 millimeter of proximal anchoring fringes to make a folding back. It can make the prevention of migration and it can serve excess port of bile duct. It has a two kinds of peak diameter and three kinds of lengths. You can see the nicely deployed uh, proximal anchoring flange. Let me show a case. <clears throat> After puncturing, dilatating, and special HGS is introducing over guide wire. And stent is deployed slowly. You can see the nicely deployed proximal anchoring flange. <clears throat> and then ultra slim scope has a 5.2 millimeter of outer diameter is introducing through the special HGS. Now scope is on bifurcation and CHD, this is endoscopy view. Now slim scope is introducing through the stent. Here is the inside of stent. And then you can see the nice bifurcation of our duct here. And also you can see the previously inserted plastic stent. And here is the common hepatic duct. So we can make some intervention through the stent. In conclusion, luminal opposing metal stent can make effective drainage and also accessible route for intervention through the gut wall. With the continuous development and improvement, we can make a better success and safe, safety and effectiveness to provide better care for our patient. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Moon. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hi, Takao. I see you. Um, hi, hi, hello, Doctor. Hello, Doctor Moon. Thank you hello. for your excellent uh, lecture. I have three questions. The first question: How to follow the patients after? Like, uh, what kind of purpose of stent? Like uh, world of necros drainage or gallbladder drainage or CDS? CDS. Oh, for CDS, so usually uh, absolute indication for CDS using specials is uh, a malignant biliary structure. Like uh, as I shown my uh, my my presentation, like uh, obstruction of distal CBD by uh, by the heavy infiltration pancreatic cancer can be the Indi uh, absolute indication. After stenting, just the usual follow-up is enough, like a uh, uh, follow-up x-ray to make sure the location of spacious in sight. And usually a spacious stent is very rare to migration, so almost a routine follow-up is enough. Thank you. What is uh, for you now the most important indication for spaxus stent placement? Uh, as I show my presentation, there are three um, um, major indications, like uh, uh, world, especially world of necrosis. Pseudosis can be managed by uh, just the plastic stents or conventional metal stent. But the world of necrosis, we should expect about the necrosectomy. 
At that point, a luminal Persian stent like axial species is much better. And number two is gallbladder drainage. We need more discussion about indication, like absolute indication or relative indication of gallbladder drainage. And three is uh, uh, CVS, cholecystodiodenostomy. I also I showed my last presentation. I modified the species for uh, HGS drainage. So it's another indication for that kind of thing. So I would like to emphasize uh, using that kind of aluminum opposing metal stent, we could make uh, some intervention through the stent, not only drain. So this for intervention through the stent. Okay, thank you. And always do you put a pigtail? Uh, pigtail, good question. So pigtail usually only, usually only for drainage of world necrosis because of two reasons. One reason is uh, sometimes that, that, that kind of large necrotic material can block even larger species, larger stand. And so we can prevent impacting that kind of necrotic material, the larger stand. And second one is uh, uh, there was a report about the possibility of high incidence of bleeding to contacting distal end of a uh, back wall. So uh, using combination of double pigtail stand can make uh, uh, reducing uh, the kind of chance of uh, bleeding. So two reasons. Thank you very much for the excellent question. I don't know, Binai, if you want to do any question more. Yeah, there are one or two more interesting questions from the audience, uh, Moon. Uh, one of them is, uh, so you showed a lovely video of the HGS. Yes. So there is a question uh, about whether you can pass the scope immediately or do you wait for a few days? And then uh, very good questions. We need, uh, we need the most studies about uh, uh, proper time to entering scope. Now yeah. I think, uh, now I the uh, cases after one week, but okay. the, but the one or two stand can make a uh, uh, migration to proximal. So mm -hmm. maybe I think after one month is the best time to make her uh, entering. Okay. One how week. about your How about your opinion, Binai? Uh, I haven't. <laughs> I have <laughs> not been using tubular stents for HGS. I haven't used the uh, specs so far for NGS. I will, I will, now that I saw your video, I will definitely use one. Okay, I will send it to you immediately by <laughs> Federal Express. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. There is one hey, last Moon. before we let you go, uh, Moon. Um, so you have done a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, or do you it forever? So if you remove, our you remove? institute absolute indication is the malignant obstruction of the take up cystic duct. So at that time, permanent placement of species. But uh, for the benign cases, almost cases is a uh, non-surgical candidate. So we would like to put the uh, species in life a long time. But the sometimes we 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 are trying to remove it, but it's safe, no problem. Does it cause any problems in a lab coli afterwards? Suppose you have removed a spexistent and uh, uh, patient goes for cholecystectomy. Is there any problem uh, after that or no? Uh, fortunately, there, there was no problem after removal. Of it. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Lovely, lovely lecture. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Nice talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our uh, next uh, speaker is Dr. Brother Mark Kohan from Thailandia. Nice to see you, Dr. Kohan. Uh, thanks for to be here with us. Uh, the lecture is about tips uh, uh, of Spaxus stand. Brother is no stranger to any, any, anybody who is here. He's a very, very well-known uh, figure in interventional EUS. Um, welcome, Pradham. Uh, you have been doing Spexus stents for quite some time now. So we want to learn yeah. from how to properly place a Spexus stent. 
Right. Thank you for giving me a chance. Uh, thanks, Vasilo and Vine, uh, for kindly introduce me. So please. My name is Dr. Pradum Chai Kongkam from Thailand. I am the current president of the THED. I would like to thank my friend Vinay Deer and the AEG very much for inviting me to give a talk today. Today my talk is about uh, practical tips of the spasa stance. As you are seeing in this slide, this is lumen opposing metal stand. Once we deploy lumen opposing metal stand successfully, one farther side of the stand will be hooked to the wall of the target organ. The other side will be locked with the lumen to prevent migration of the stent. The stent can be deployed by endoscopic ultrasound, echo endoscope. Steps of EUS guided drainage. In general, for our EUS guided pseudocyst drainage, gallbladder drainage, biliary drainage, we start with puncturing process, then dilation the tract and then stent placement. To puncture into the target organ, generally it can be performed with 19 gauge needle with guide wire. However, at this time with the hot system, so sometimes we don't need guide wire, we don't need 19 gauge needle, we just use the hot system. Anyway, some experts still prefer to use 19 gauge needle first with the guide wire in even though the hot system, this is to ensure the track in some difficult case. The second step for dilation. Typically, endosonographers start dilation process with a coagulator. Then it can be followed by either a cilio dilator, for example, showing dust dilator or balloon dilator. And the last step, we go to the stent pressman. So for stent pressman, Techniques to deploy stent depends on types of the target organ and also depends on the type of the stent, including plastic stent, breed stent, lamps, and hepatical gastrostomy stent. Today I will cover the spasus, which is lumen opposing metal stent for stent deployment. For spasus, it has two system. The first one is a cold system. For the cold system, the delivery system is 10 French diameter of the delivery system. Length of the stent is about 2 cm in length. If you look at this image, which is very important, for the catheter, you will see the yellow marker and the next one will be inner X-ray marker. The next one will be the blue marker. And the last one or the fattest one is outer X-ray marker. So for outer and inner X-ray marker, this can be seen by fluoroscopic image. But for blue marker and yellow marker, this can be seen under endoscopic image. So in step one, when the outer X-ray markers overlap with the inner X-ray marker, why you are deploying the stent when the outer come 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 comes until overlap with the inner x-ray marker at this point it meant that the distal fence is completely open then you will use the endoscopic view in step two when the blue marker is visible under the endoscopic view you are ready to start opening proximal fringe of the stent. For the hot system, difference from the cold system is at the tip of the distal fringe. It has electro cautery tip and this will be connected with the electro cautery enable delivery system which you will plug this to the electoral cautery machine. You select the pad specifically by generator manufacturer and set the setting to PL cut mode 80 to 120 watts 
400 to 500 volts and connect the plug to the electrostatical unit with a compatible active carrier. And similar to the cold system, the hot system has blue marker, outer X-ray, inner X-ray marker, and yellow marker. So when the outer X-ray marker overlaps with the inner X-ray marker, it means that the distal fringe is completely open. And when the blue marker is visible under endoscopic view, you can start opening of the proximal fringe. This video demonstrates deployment of the sparse stent in model. Firstly, you unlock the stent. Secondly, you deploy the stent until outer X-ray marker go to the inner X-ray marker. After that, pull the stent. And with the endoscopic view, once you see the blue marker, you can continue deployment. Until the proximal front is fully open and the blue color overlap with the yellow mm. marker. Okay. Mm. So I like to show you one more time. Firstly, deploy the distal fringe. Outer X ray marker come to the inner X ray marker. Once it's come, the distal fringe is fully deployed. Then pull the stand back until using the endoscopic view, you can see the blue marker. And then continue deploying the stand. Until the blue marker overlap with the yellow marker, then the distal mm -hmm. frame is fully open. Okay. Mm -hmm. US guided pancreatic fluid collection drainage with the cold spaces. This is created by one of my ex fellow, Dr. Pia Pum. In this patient, 56 year old female with peripancreatitis came with abdominal pain. CT scan show large pancreatic fluid collection. We use the hot spaces when in. We use the cold spaces. So then we start with the 19 gauge needle with the guide wire in. And then we left the guide wire in the cavity. Here the guide wire is. After electrocautery dilator, dilation was performed with the helicane balloon. Here the helicane balloon is four millimeter. And then we deploy the distal fringe until outer come to the inner marker. We pull the stand close to the wall of the pancreatic fluid collection and completely deploy the stand, similar to the technique that I just described. Here is another case created by Dr. Chalem Pon Bunmi, who is my ex-fellow. This is a case of uh, EUS guided PFC drainage by the hot spaces. So this is a 63-year-old male with history of severe pancreatitis and large pancreatic fluid collection. So we schedule for 
U.S. guided PFC drainage by the hot spaces. So we puncture and dilate the track in the same time with the hot spaces. Once the hot spaces in, we deploy the distal fringe, pull the stent back until the distal fringe reach to the wall of the PFC. And we can see the blue marker with the endoscopic view. And then we continue deployment. And now it's fully deployed. This is the final fluoroscopic image of the fully deployed. And we dilate the stent with the balloon and use the echo uh, gastroscope to do the direct endoscopic necrosectomy in this case. This is another interesting case. In this case, we have placed the first stent and it's been migrated into the PFC cavity. So then we have to help the patient by push the cold spaces. as a second lamp. And finally, we can successfully press the cold spaces and we can retrieve the first migrated stent out. But during the procedure, when we remove the migrated stent, so the lamps that we just pressed also follow the micro stand as you see in this uh, video. So then the second lamps also migrated out and this is the first lamp that was in the pancreatic free collection. So then we come back we see the fistula is still open. So then we use the um, third lamps and deploy under the endoscopic view. And you can see now that we use the gastroscopy and the gastroscopy can also be used to deploy the stent. I'd like to show you one more time. You see the uh, blue image here, right? This is a blue image. So once you see the blue image, you continue deployment, pulling back until the proximal fringe fully open. So now we can deploy the third lamp for this patient under um, gastroscopy. And we can continue direct endoscopic necrosectomy procedure. This is another interesting technique. The video has been created by one of my ex-US fellow, Dr. Khan from Vietnam. So the patient has worn and we have used lamps for successful direct endoscopic necrosectomy. Unfortunately, two weeks after that, the patient still has symptomatic worn. We don't want to continue lamps through the pancreatic uh, to, to, from one through the stomach longer than a couple of weeks in our center. So then we decided to chain lamps to the plastic stent. But just want to make sure that the um, plastic stent uh, will be in place. So then we use double channel gastroscope. Before we remove the lamps, we insert the catheter with the guide wire into the worn cavity and we use another channel using the red tooth forceps to pull the lamps out. But catheter and the guide wire is still in the pancreatic fluid collection as you see by this video. We still keep the track and we use 
another channel to pull the lamps back, and then we insert the plastic stand across the lumen of the lamps. I like uh, to see this, uh, show this for one more time. Here, we insert the stand through the lamps. And after that, we can keep the track open. So we insert another guide wire and press another plastic stand. So this is another technique to ensure that we can keep the fistula open. The reason that we have to make sure the um, make sure that the plastic stand go deep because the collection of this patient is very big. So if you see on the fluoroscopic view here, it go down very far to make sure that both plastic stand go to the deep part of the wand and then we can do the direct endoscopic necrosectomy later and safely. Hello, yes. So uh, I think we finished the video. Fantastic uh, presentation, uh, Pradham. Very, very nice uh, and real good practical tips uh, for those uh, who are going to use PEXIS now. And also good tips for those who are already using so they can learn. <laughs> so, Lazaro, any questions? Yes, excellent lecture. Very, very excellent. Thank you. Uh, uh, my first question is the migration frequency. Is frequent the migration with the sparsus? Migration. Oh, oh actually, migration. very, very infrequent. Very infrequent. And I think that if you learn the technique to deploy uh, the stent properly, chance of the migration is very low. Okay. And today you will learn uh, several times from various kinds of lamps. And I hope that after this lecture, I think we all agree that uh, uh, endoscopic who will perform this procedure will not uh, make a migration happen again. I wish. Thank you. What do you do with the post-procedure uh, bleeding? And the breathing? With blood, with breathing. With breathing. Uh, yeah. I mean, you mean breathe, breathing during the transmural puncture or yes. breathing inside the uh, or PFC? By, in by uh, breathing inside the procedure. During, during the procedure. Actually, yeah. at, at, the, at the beginning, before we start doing a PFC drainage, we try hard to avoid intervening vessels. And then uh, we don't want to, uh, to cause the breathing. But if it happens uh, sometime, if it's not at that active and you don't have a particular point that you can uh, provide a hemocrip or whatever to stop the breathing, so then you can wait and see. But if the breathing is still active, we, you, you will know within a few, uh, uh, maybe 30 minutes or 60 minutes, maybe we need some help from the uh, interventional radiologist. Thank you. Uh, do you use always dilatation? After the stain placement? Um, actually, I think this is another point for discussion today. And today, because of Vine, we have uh, several uh, lecturers covering for all varieties of the um, uh, lamps. So then, uh, I think that each lamp, they have a different uh, radio force. So then, uh, in the uh, stronger with the lamps with the higher radio force, probably you don't need to but lamps with the uh, um, I mean, uh, lower radio force, you might uh, need to do that. But for me, personally, uh, I do not dilate the uh, track. After, I, I, I don't dilate the lumen of the lamps because um, I think that maybe one day later, it should be dilated and, and enough, except we have to do some proposed uh, specifically. For example, 
we want to drain all the necrotic material or we want to uh, take uh, the migrated uh, stent uh, from the PFC. So in that case, we might need to do, uh, to, uh, uh, do the dilation immediately with the CRE balloon. But uh, no normally, I wouldn't do that. And if you do that, one thing that you have to be concerned, after you dilate the tract and then you try uh, to push the gastroscope to do the necrosectomy immediately, sometimes the uh, diameter of the lamps is not well explained. Uh, expanded. So then uh, the uh, gastroscope might uh, bring the uh, lamps out incidentally. And wow. that happened uh, sometime in my unit. Yes. Good point. <laughs> Good point. I have one question for you. Yeah. Um, you ha if you uh, have placed a Spexa stent or, or any other LAMS and you uh, later on found out that this patient has a disconnected duct syndrome. So would you uh, remove this stent and then keep a plastic stent inside or would you just remove this, this stent and not do anything? What would be your... Yeah, uh, that, that's, that's a good question and actually result from your study is very uh, informative and congratulate for that. So, but and in, in our uh, unit, after we have uh, successful drainage of the wall by either lamps, plastic stent or whatever, if possible, we try to do the pancreatogram either by the MRCP or by the ERP because the uh, 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 continuous leakage of the pancreatic duct to the pancreatic fluid collection is very important. And that might cause recurrent symptomatic pancreatic fluid collection again. So then if it happens, we try to fix by the transfer transferability pancreatic stenting. But if there is no connection, certainly we can remove the cystogastrosomy stent. But uh, if there is some uh, continuous uh, leakage from the main pancreatic duct, if we fail to fix that by transferably pancreatic stenting, then we need, need to keep the cystogastrostomy stent for, for good. And in that case, certainly we need to change from the metal stent to the plastic stent. Yes. Uh, this is my practice. Yeah. Use yeah. a plastic stent. Okay. Okay. Moon, what do you do? Um, uh, we need the keeping plastic stent after removal of specials, definitely, with for disconnecting pancreatic duct syndrome, no choice. I'm seeing you are back to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. From, from now, I'm summer vacation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because you've done very hard work for this conference, Winnie. You have to pay for his trip. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Pandam. Thanks, Moon. Thanks a lot. I think we should move on uh, to the next uh, lecture. And it's a, again a topic very close to my heart uh, plastic stents. Uh, um, um, somehow we are going too much metal, becoming Metallica, and we are forgetting plastic stents. And um, um, Takao, um, Professor Takao Itoi, a very good friend of ours, is here who has developed a plastic stent. So um, let us hear from him how he got the idea of developing a plastic stent and uh, where does he use it and what are the results. Uh, Taka. Thank you, kind introduction, Binai. I'm also just in my summer holiday now. <laughs> <laughs> Again, uh, thank you very much for having me here. So. Let's get started. My talk, my talk uh, uh, is on the plastic, dedicated plastic stand for interventional EUS. Okay, in the BRA stenting uh, by means of ERCP, you know, the, we commonly use the plastic stent and the metal stent. I think the selection of a stent uh, depends on the case, case by case. For example, the malignant or benign or uh, temporary or permanent or uh, until die or long lasting. And the, you know, the recently the uh, US guided bureau drainage is emerging. As you can see, uh, there are mainly two access routes, namely the cholecystomy and the hepatic gastrostomy. In such cases, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the access route, uh, uh, metal stent is frequently used. Uh, 
uh, we also frequently use the metal stent. And also, the, in terms of uh, hepatic gastrostomy, the, we frequently use uh, metal stent, and uh, uh, also uh, we use a plastic stent. Even in uh, US guided pancreatic duct drainage uh, stenting, uh, rarely, but we use a metal stent, like here. Uh, very rare, mostly uh, we use a plastic stent uh, because uh, in the setting of uh, benign their restriction usually, right? So since uh, early, at the early stage of interventional US, plastic and uh, metal stent were dedicated to ERCP stent. So uh, we have experienced uh, sometimes the difficulty of uh, uh, stent placement uh, by not only uh, metal stent, but also plastic stent. So what kind of stent is optimal? Uh, anyway, so old one is a dedicated, always a dedicated ERCP stent. So uh, that's why so I'm thinking of a uh, newly dedicated uh, stent for interventional use like this. So I'd like to show how to make a new plastic stent. First, uh, how to how to come up with the uh, IT stand? What is the uh, uh, optimal stand? I think uh, more uh, so good, uh, uh, better application for benign disease. Uh, removal is uh, mandatory, and the pushability, trackability is uh, uh, also very important. And the easy placement. Uh, I mean, uh, more tapered tip, more tapered tip here. And the no state migration uh, is uh, also mandatory. And the, even though the drain, drainage, the aim of a uh, stent is drain. That's why, so where drain is uh, also a good thing, a most, most important thing. And uh, also, minimum risk of bile or pancreatic juice is uh, a very important point. So, how to develop? So, I cannot, I cannot make a, a stand by myself, by myself. That's why, so let's make a new plastic stand with... Uh, uh, Taka, if I can interrupt, sorry. There is a... Something blocking your slides. Um, it's not, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. You can see? No, I can see the slide now, but when you make it full screen, there is a thing uh, which is Apple. Maybe you'll have to uh, reduce it, the red. And uh, there is something written in Japanese, and then there are some marks, color marks. You can see? I can see the slide, but there is something in front of it. Uh, I think it's a font. You're, you're writing your color, font, the color. I know. Color panel. Color panel. Yes. Color panel. Yeah. So maybe you'll have to stop the color panel on your computer. Color panel. Yes. Oh, I'm not sure. You can see. Uh, uh, do you want to try to stop uh, sharing and then maybe you can see? Anyway, you can see a mouse, right? There's a, there's a, yes, we do, but there's a blocking. It's blocking. One of, yeah, um, when you, maybe um, you can take a photo. For oh, it's gone now. It's gone yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. it's here now. No, no. But return again. Just went and came back. Oh, exactly. There's no uh, desktop. Oh. So the color panel window, you will have to close. List? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, List, oh. Huh? it come. came back. <laughs> okay, soon close come there. back. Soon come back. Okay. Yes, yeah. Yes. Okay, now, okay, okay. Now share slides. Thank you. Thank you.
while we are waiting for Takao. Um, hi, Mark. Welcome. Professor Giovannini is with us for the next lecture. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hello, Mark. Welcome. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Johnny. Hello, Lazaro. Hello. I'm fine. And you? Very well. And you? <laughs> yeah, very well. Thank you. Takao has locked out, I think. He has to yeah. lock. Vinny, maybe you use your phone, take a screen of Takao and send to him, and perhaps he will know what, what yeah. does it mean for the Apple one. In the end, but I don't know, he's locked out by mistake. I think he'll have to come back again. Sorry about this. this these things happen, technical issues with slides and other things. So I'm sure Taka will resolve them and come back to us. In the meanwhile, if there are any more questions, let me find out. So, um, Pradham, there is a very simple question for you. Why you want to use a pigtail stent? Why not a straight stent through the metal stent? Oh, I, I think it's absolutely better because it uh, has pigtail both arms. Right. So prevent uh, migration, right? Oh. Yeah, I think. Do you use a straight stent? through the lamps? The question from someone. So uh, I always use a double pigtail like you. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And um, maybe uh, I have a question for either Moon, you, that uh, for the um, CDS and that you use lamps. And then later on, the lamps work very well. So then it's been there. Patient is still living very well. If you don't push the double pigtail plastic stent, across the lumen of the lamp. Any trouble of the recurrent cholangitis because of collapsing of the wall and hit to the uh, one end of the lamps? Yes, yes. I, I agree with you totally. A plastic stand is very helpful in these situations. Yeah. How about you, Moon? Yeah. Yes, I agree. But so sometimes, but not always, sometimes I put the double pigotail stand even through the CBS. But there are... Uh, Surprisingly, uh, I never met that kind of blocking of the distal or distal end of the spacious by the reducing of CBD diameter. Uh, so, uh, or, almost no problem of that kind of adverse event. So, uh, for the, I recommend to the uh, beginning doctors, uh, even after specials for CDS, uh, put the uh, double pigtail stand can make some, make sure, make sure of the drainage. So uh, I recommend to uh, the beginning doctors, even yes. CDS. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mark, you also use a plastic stand uh, through uh, LAMS? For CDS? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. But this prevents uh, two, uh, two, two complications. And then the first is the, as uh, Professor Jung said, that there is the, 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 the occlusion by the contralateral wall of the CBD, but also the food impaction. Because food impaction is the, is the worst complication uh, that uh, we, uh, we, we have with the, with the LAMPS and CDS. Yes, yes, yes. I think lamp is very good for the uh, CDS. And Vinay, do you still use a uh, tubular stent for CDS or totally change yeah. to the lamps? Use tubular stent sometimes. So cost becomes an issue uh, for us because lots of our patients are not insured. So we mm. have to offer them various choices. Uh, and of course, we tell them this is better. But sometimes because of cost issues, we still... Uh, uh, use tubular stents for CDS also. Yeah. And also, it's in some con conditions, sometimes the, the CBD is not so dilated. And the, the, mainly the patient has a huge uh, gallbladder and uh, the CBD is not uh, 
it's oh, 10, 12 millimeter, and it's uh, easier to insert uh, a standard biliary, uh, fully covered biliary stent uh, than, uh, than, uh, than a lamp in this uh, special condition. Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's that's a good comment, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, Moon, your slide presentation is very nice. You use the uh, lamps for the CDS, and you insert the uh, kaleidoscope through the uh, lamps. That's very interesting. So, how big of the lamp that you use in that case, and how many days you left the lamps in press before pushing the kaleidoscope in? For uh, for spectros for CDS, we could introduce the kind of uh, gastroscope uh, actually immediately uh, or just two or three days later. It's different with uh, HGS. So it can make a very firm a position. So you can introduce uh, a gastroscope through the stand. But I would like to recommend uh, using uh, ultra slim scope, like a nasal scope. To inserting of scope and still the movement of the tip of uh, gastroscope is a little bit different inside the bile duct to reaching proximal portion like uh, or, or over the hilum. So uh, I think we need uh, some a modification of gastroscope for specialized uh, intervention through the lamps in the future. So maybe you can ask a company and collaborate to develop the kind of maybe new new types of scope for the intervention through the lamp. Yeah. And, and, and uh, what, what did you do after you already pressed the CDS stent for drainage in malignant and resectable case? It's all done. Yes, what what, so what will you do for uh, more with the kaleidoscope after that? You know the kind of like a, a heavy infiltration of cancer or this CBD. We couldn't make a tissue sampling, and after introduction of a scope uh, to distal CBD, we could make a tissue biopsy and make a confirmation of malignancy, and uh, also <clears throat> intentional removal of, of floating stones. So I have the, some cases of the removal of migrated some a fragment of plastic a stand or PTVD tube, and it's like my hobby. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we. I know. I know. <laughs> okay, Takao is back. Takao, sorry Takao. for. Takao, hey, welcome. Huh. Yeah. Oh, it's still there. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Let it be. The color screen. You stand with the company. One company is a Galerius Medical Company. As you can see, uh, uh, this is originally uh, Swed Swedish, Sweden company. And uh, now uh, one the company in Japan. Japan. And uh, we collaborate uh, with uh, this company and uh, uh, we make a new stent. You can see uh, this stent. Uh, Polyacetylene uh, materials is uh, common, common materials, not, not, not so special, not special. And uh, oh. And the uh, other taper tip here, other taper tip, and so no stent migration because uh, uh, peak tail and two big branch, two both side big branch, and uh, well drained because uh, both end of course usually, and the four aperture uh, hole here and here, and eight small holes, a peak tail portion and uh, around here on the two uh, cm. And the minimum break, minimum breakage of uh, uh, pancreatic juice or bile, bile, because uh, no hole uh, between the two uh, both end. And uh, I'd like to show the out, our outcome and the cases. So you can see uh, animation the plastic stent. 
prismate. Yes. After depiction of the dilated bar duct into hepatic bar duct and the 19 gauge needle puncture, sometimes we use a 22 gauge needle, especially in benign, benign disease because of a small duct, non dilated ducts frequently. And finally, I descent praised. So you can see our uh, outcome here. And uh, at this moment, a small, very small number of cases. Uh, I'm very happy the technical and clinical success is 100%, and the adverse event uh, are three cases with a mild adverse event. And the occlusion rate, 14%. Uh, uh, surprisingly, the four months patent and the up to nine months. Uh, I mean, uh, occlusion rate is uh, uh, 19 cases, uh, no occlusion until die. It is a very important thing. And uh, at this moment, at this moment, there is no obvious uh, uh, difference between the plastic stent and the metal stent in uh, hepatic or gastrostomic cases. And of course, including benign and uh, uh, malignant disease, very mixed. You can see a uh, uh, case, this guy is hepatic or using a dedicated stent. The targeted uh, dilated duct here, not so dilation. So, fortunately, uh, we got a small bile duct and the injection uh, very nicely cholangiography obtained. And guide wire insertion. At this moment, uh, all two one inch uh, guide wire, uh, the cook guide wire, uh, insulation guide wire, that's why. So we can use a uh, uh, cautery dilator at this moment and change the O2 five inch guide wire, busy right and after dilation, finally, plastic center was praised. Very easy. And uh, we saw that uh, uh, US HGS uh, using dedicated stand sounds nice, sounds nice. Uh, however, clinically, uh, in the setting of uh, malignant distal bile duct structure, uh, we frequently uh, use uh, uh, U.S. guided antigrade stating plus uh, hepatic gastro uh, because uh, physiological bile flow is antigrade stating is much better uh, with large bore metal scent the, like skimmer and the, to keep the access route for reintervention like this. So uh, I'd like to show the movie as well. Uh, very naturally dilated duct. Relatively easy case. Not so complicated case and the distal biliary st structure. A long structure and the guard wire impressed in the duodenum. Left in place and after measure, measuring the uh, distance of the structure and uncovered. Usually we use the uncovered metal stent. Up to a la portion and to keep the access route and the whole the intervention safety and the plastic stent was appraised. So you can see our outcome of uh, US guided antiquated metal stenting with uh, a hepatic gastro using IT stent. Uh, so our data here, we very, very satisfied our outcome on not only the technical, clinical success and the advanced event, but also time to dysfunction here. The only three cases, uh, uh, the, uh, the occlusion uh, until die, and the time to dysfunction date uh, to six, three days along long lasting uh, patent. Uh, we are very happy to uh, see. And uh, in terms of medical cost, uh, our technique may be uh, more cost effective and uh, more benefit.
maybe a similar uh, outcome to the metal stent uh, with metal stent. And the interestingly, so like this, uh, but uh, in case of a short prognosis, less than two, two months or three months, and US guided hepatic gastro alone, uh, using a, a IT stent alone, uh, in, is the more, I guess, the most cheapest, most cheap, most cheap drainage uh, cost if plastic stent of uh, hepatic gastro is uh, patent until die. I think so. So, but uh, some some uh, some people, some endoscopists, worried about the exchange of this stent. The how to exchange with the new uh, this stent uh, alongside the guide uh, the stent using a catheter and the guide wire alongside alongside the guide wire in place in the bad duct first, and left left the guide wire in place, and uh, using a uh, snare. Sometimes the sunia is very difficult. So anyway, so in this case, fortunately, the grass uh, stand edge and the got wire right in place and and remove through the scope easily and so replace uh, the, as well as the IT stand. Another case also, uh, this is a very difficult position. Fortunately, the alongside the stand, that wire advance easily in the interhepatic bile duct and keeping the guide wire in the bile duct. And usually we use a, a lot forceps to remove the stent, like this. Forcep, of course, uh, some uh, expertise of the US or uh, ERCP doctor, maybe just remove the stent and uh, put the guide wire is uh, easy. But I, so for the beginner, the, this uh, the technique is very safe. I think we can remove the through the scope, keep it the guard wire in the, in the bilateral in place, and the, you can see a USPD animation. Uh, previously, I showed the, uh, sometime using a guide wire. The, the past stricture side, as long as uh, possible. And after dilation of the uh, gastric wall and the parenchymal pancreas, also anastomosis. And finally, IT scent is praised. Of course, uh, sometimes we use uh, a balloon uh, to dilate the anastomosis. To uh, usually the six six c uh, six millimeter in diameter, and finally across the structure we press a plastic stand, IT stand. So this is the first report. Of a small the number of cases very small, but uh, a relatively nice outcome. So after this we use uh, now the more than. Uh, 60 cases using this stent. And the uh, intermittent uh, analysis, you can see uh, long term clinical success rate is uh, 92%. Uh, I'm very, uh, we are very comfortable uh, for this uh, the outcome. So I'd like to show the movie. So this is a dilated pancreatic duct. Looks a soft pancreas. In, in such cases, uh, not so difficult to puncture and the dilation of the uh, pan uh, pancreatic duct. After uh, uh, this is a uh, failed ERCP cases. The guide wire in place 
as long as possible in the uh, pancreatic duct. And after dilation, in case of USPD, we frequently use a uh, uh, cautery dilator, but in this case is an ES dilator, mechanical, very ultra tapered tip uh, right away, uh, dilator to avoid the necessary breathing or perforation. And very easily, smoothly, the push. And finish. And in this case, very small duct. In this case, after uh, post whip patient and the pancreatic fissure is present. That's why so non dilated pancreatic duct. Very small and the 22 gauge needle advance in the pancreatic duct. Fortunately, the the pancreatic ground was obtained as well as the O2018 inch guide wire advanced in the pancreatic duct. After the relation, this is not so hard pancreas, so uh, just uh, uh, standard catheter is possible to advance in the pancreatic duct. And after that, uh, exchange with uh, O25 inch hard type uh, busy grade and the dilation of the fistula, and finally, I distinct was placed. After this, uh, the pancreatic fistula dis disappeared, and the patient discharged, happy, very happy. And the, in case of uh, PD stent exchange, uh, is is uh, uh, very difficult comparing to the uh, hepaticogastro, because uh, the, Scope, scope tip is very floppy in the post whip patient or something. That's why. But even though the uh, expertise of uh, ERCP may be possible, like uh, uh, bile duct cannulation and exchange the stent. So future, uh, last uh, but not least, uh, this is uh, the future direction. I think uh, now we just made a uh, repositionable uh, stand, uh, con consolidated ID stand. The minimum step down tip, very easy to uh, advance in the, uh, the pancreatic duct or bile duct. Maybe coming soon, in the, uh, available in Japan. So I think in future directions, three point uh, more cheap and effective. The cheaper, cheaper is very important for the patient, in some patient. Not, not always uh, rich people uh, in, the, in each country. And absorbable or expandable, I'm, I'm one thinking. And the another one is a more easy selection or placement of stent or individual stent size or diameter or something uh, is uh, one of option. And the expanding ID stent uh, to the world for a patient. First launch in uh, end of this year, uh, I guess uh, Taiwan, in Taiwan. I hope uh, we will uh, distribute uh, more and more in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Takao. Thanks a lot. Wonderful lecture as usual. Um, okay. So, um, patients who cannot afford a metal stent, patients with malignant obstruction, uh, you think this stent can be useful uh, for uh, drainage of bile duct? Do you have a data on how long does this stent uh, remain patent? So, bile duct? Yes. Bile duct is uh, uh, so whole mass. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that, that is uh, very similar to the transpapillary plastic stenting. That's why, so in uh, three or four months prognosis patient is uh, just uh, put the IT stent. Okay, and one more question. I'm sorry, we are running a little late. Um, suppose you put a routine, you know, the uh, stents that are available in the market. Is there a difference in the leak rate? Uh, so you, you try to push a routine plastic stent and do an HGS. 
mm-hmm. versus an IT stent. I love the IT stent, of course, uh, but just for people who have been asking this question, um, is there any uh, difference? Um, if you can explain why IT stent, I feel it is much better, easier to push. Um, what would you say uh, about this? Uh, it is very important thing. So if we cannot use uh, IT st- like IT st- dedicated stent, we have no choice. But uh, the tract dilation is the most important thing before stenting. That's why. So step by step. So uh, if possible, the hurricane dilator or something the other uh, the enough dilation. Then, okay. so put a standing. Okay, so higher chances of problems, more steps. Exactly. exactly. Right, 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 right. Thanks, Takao. Thanks a lot. Many Thank more. You so much. But uh, you. running late, um, wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. Very, very nice. nice. Very nice. Thanks. So, um, uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, well known to everyone. Mark uh, Giovannini. Um, Pradham, please. Uh, Adieu. Mark, uh, Hello? Yeah. do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. So okay, you, do you have my... Uh... How you thought about viewers and how the idea came? Really <laughs> to... I will... Uh, I will give you the... The answer on my, my presentation, I will uh, uh, show you also the, the quite the, the the history of the hepatico gastrostomy because the the idea of the Jopor stent is uh, quite parallel to the development of the hepatico gastrostomy. <laughs> uh, this is the, the 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 beginning of the of the story of the hepatico of the hepatico gastrostomy. This is a, a very old paper published by the. A radiologist was a French radiologist. His name was uh, Soulez, and uh, he, uh, for patient with advanced and palliative uh, uh, treatment of uh, of jaundice, he, he developed this uh, um, this uh, idea to uh, to do an internal external drainage of, of the liver, uh, guided by uh, PTBD and also laparoscopically guided. Uh, to uh, to do uh, an endoscopically and laparoscopically uh, guided uh, to do uh, this uh, uh, kind of montage with uh, uh, an internal drainage and also always an external access uh, to the to the to the bile duct uh, and the goal is to uh, to allow to have an internal drainage and not to have uh, an external drainage with all the complications that the external drainage occur. But uh, uh, this uh, this technique it was very very clever. But uh, you see that the, even if the, the success rate was uh, was no bad, the, the morbidity of this technique was uh, a little bit uh, uh, too high, and also it was not so easy uh, to perform because uh, therefore to perform this uh, hepatico gastrostomy using uh, this. Uh, uh, radiology, uh, you, you need a radiologist, you need a, a gastroenterologist, an endoscopist, and uh, a surgeon to perform uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, technique. It's for this reason that this technique disappeared. At the, the end of the, the, the last century, this is what, probably my first case, my first hepatico gastrostomy that I performed. At this time, you see uh, the scope. Uh, 38 uh, uh, UX uh, uh, from Pentax with the uh, 3.8 uh, uh, millimeter walking channel, but there is no elevator. And this is the uh, first case that I performed. It was a patient with uh, a huge pseudocystic dilatation of the bile duct, and the idea was to uh, to treat this uh, uh, dilatation of the of the of the bile duct. Uh, like a pseudocyst, because uh, I had performed a lot of uh, pseudocyst drainage using uh, uh, this technique with this one step, uh, uh, one step device, and uh, we perform uh, this uh, uh, this puncture, this direct puncture of the uh, of the the dilated uh, pseudocystic dilatation of the uh, of the duct, and you see here uh, the the stent, the plastic stent 
uh, in place. And this is the endoscopic uh, uh, view with the two stents inserted in the two uh, uh, the huge dilatation of the uh, of this uh, uh, bile duct. And the, the patient uh, went well uh, during uh, some uh, some week. And this is the first uh, publication uh, the, uh, in endoscopy, and you see this, this was the, the case of a patient uh, with uh, uh, a right hepatectomy for uh, gastric cancer. The patient uh, developed a recurrence. A first uh, metallic stent was inserted uh, by PTC, and the patient relapsed, and the patient refused to, to, have, a, uh, to have a second uh, PTBD uh, procedure. And we decided together to, to try this uh, new, uh, new uh, technique. And for this hepatic gastrostomy, we, we use a partially uh, covered stent. And this stent will, uh, will stay in place uh, very well during, uh, two, during three weeks. Uh, and uh, after three weeks, the, 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 the stent uh, has partially migrated into the, uh, the uh, gastric wall. And this is the, the first uh, uh, video case uh, uh, in the world, I think, during a live demonstration uh, of an uh, hepaticogastrostomy. It was uh, performed in uh, Malaysia in the unit of, uh, of uh, Ryan. Uh, it was a case of uh, uh, patient with jaundice and uh, duodenal involvement uh, by a pancreatic cancer. It was not possible to reach the papilla with the the duodenoscope, and uh, we decided with uh, uh, Jacques Devier uh, uh, and Ryan to do an hepaticogastrostomy. But uh, at this uh, time, we, uh, we, the problem was uh, we don't uh, have uh, uh, the small uh, cystostome, uh, and we will use uh, also a partially uh, covered stent. And you see one, uh, the first the technique, uh, you know very well, the, the, the opacification, the insertion of the wire. But we use the 10 French cystostome, which is the the first mistake, eh, because the the stent French cystostome is uh, is too big, uh, and uh, uh, even if in this case we, we succeed to, to insert the the ten French cystostome into the uh, into the, the bile duct, uh, the patient uh, uh, we succeed also to insert the the, the, the partially covered stent, eight centimeter. But the patient developed a bill leakage uh, one week after due to the uh, the large uh, the large uh, puncturing uh, dilation induced by the ten French uh, the ten French cystostome. And here you see the uh, the quality of the video is not very good because it's a very old video. Uh, and here you see the the, the, the opening of this uh, partially uh, covered uh, stent uh, into the uh, into the stomach. And also, uh, if you see at this time, uh, the, we leave uh, not too much, uh, uh, too much stent into the into the stomach. Alors why uh, why the, the, the idea of the Jobor the Jobor stent is uh, because the the you see on this on this slide that there is uh, between the 2002 and 2015 a large number of series were, were published, and using plastic stent. Using also a stent in stent technique, which is a, a, a technique using a first 10 centimeter uncovered stent, metallic stent, and uh, in, uh, inside the stent to prevent the bill leakage, we inserted a, a six centimeter fully covered stent. Partially covered stent, uh, fully covered stent, but the main uh, problem is that uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the fully covered stent has a high risk of migration and bill leakage. Plastic stent, we need to have uh, to dilate the penteric tract and also with a high risk of bill leakage. Partially covered stent and fully covered stent, there is obstruction of the side branch of the bile duct tree and with high risk of cholangitis and liver abscess. All these data were, were reported on the, on the paper of uh, Michel Calale in 2013. Uh, and just uh, to show you, this is a uh, an, an image of uh, uh, an hepato uh, cholangiocarcinoma uh, drain endoscopically for the right lobe and uh, the using a partially covered stent for the left lobe uh, with using the US root. And here you, you see this paper of um, uh, Michel Calale, uh, and you see that uh, on this series is uh, interesting because uh, for hepaticogastrostomy, 
uh, in for, uh, in uh, seven uh, in sixty seven percent of cases we use uh, a metallic stand and uh, in thirty percent of cases a uh, plastic stand. But the main the main problem uh, you you understand was uh, the uh, bill leakage. It was quite ten percent of bill leakage and also uh, twelve percent of bleeding. Uh, mainly uh, using uh, the, this is due to the use of uh, uh, the, um, the pre-cutting uh, uh, pre um, uh, catheter uh, to, uh, and not the, the cystostome to create the anastomosis between the, uh, the left lobe, the left biliary lobe and the stomach. This is uh, the, the, all the paper published uh, uh, today uh, using the, the for hepaticogastrostomy, but if you see, this is all in all this paper. You have a case one, two, three, four, five percent of case uh, of uh, biliary leakage, and biliary leakage is uh, really the the, the 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 worst complication during uh, uh, hepaticogastrostomy. I hope to solve this, and this is uh, the the idea to to use this. Uh, this Jobor stand. This is the, the first generation of uh, of Jobor stand. It was a, a eight or ten centimeter uh, stand, uh, half covered, and the uncovered part will be pushed inside the bile duct to prevent the migration, and the covered part uh, to uh, uh, was inserted through the, ga the gastric wall to prevent the the bee leakage. And I have this idea because I saw. The stent that the radiologist used for uh, uh, for the portal hypertension uh, to do tips for the portal hypertension uh, is uh, quite the same idea. It was uh, one part is uncovered, one part is covered uh, to uh, to achieve the, the the treatment of the of the portal uh, hypertension. But why the name Jobo? Why? Because Jo is the is the beginning of my my name. Uh, Bo is the beginning of the name of my collaborator at this moment, uh, Erwan Bori, and here you see the, the draw, the first draw that uh, we, we gave to the Taiwan company uh, to, uh, to perform this, uh, uh, this uh, stent. What are the advantages of, of, the, of, the, of the Jobor stent? Is that uh, is the, the, uh, the uncovered part prevents the migration and the obstruction of the side branch of the bile duct? The covered part will prevent the bill leakage. The large flare try to prevent the, the, the migration. And also it's easy uh, to clean uh, when obstruction. And uh, here you see you have this uh, uh, obstructed uh, uh, hepaticogastrostomy and it's uh, using a gastroscope, a thin gastroscope. is uh, uh, easy to, uh, to clean with a balloon and to go uh, quite inside the uh, the, uh, the liver and after to, uh, to leave another, uh, another stent uh, inside. That is uh, one of the main advantages uh, of the, uh, the hepatico uh, gastrostomy. This is the, uh, our paper published now uh, three years ago and we, we have evaluated prospectively 41 patients uh, in which the, the, there were an indication of uh, uh, hepatico gastrostomy. And you see that uh, uh, in this uh, uh, 31 patient, there is no bee leakage reported. We have a cholangitis uh, due to the, uh, the obstruction of the stent, or sometimes the cover part was too, uh, uh, too inserted inside the, the bile duct and they covered some uh, side branch uh, obstruction and one case of migration uh, with, of course, uh, a, a bee leakage, but uh, migration. Uh, occur only in one uh, of these uh, 41 patients. The second generation of Shobo is a little bit different because there is a, a Japanese study that uh, evaluated the, the length of the, uh, of the, the uncovered part. And probably 50% uh, it was uh, a little bit uh, too much because we need uh, probably to reduce uh, uh, the risk of a bill leakage, you need to have a long covered part. And uh, this, uh, this paper has uh, evaluated uh, one, two, and three centimeters of uh, uncovered parts, and the best results are obtained uh, with the, uh, the uh, three centimeters uncovered uh, for the 10 centimeter uh, stent. 
uh, and you see this uh, this image with the large flange and the flange was uh, larger than the first generation to prevent uh, again uh, the risk of uh, uh, of migration and now this is a uh, uh, one case uh, of uh, uh, of uh, your bore uh, insertion of the new uh, generation. It was a patient uh, with uh, uh, cholangitis and uh, obstruction of a previous, uh, of a previous biliary stent in place. It was not possible to reach again the papilla due to a duodenal involvement. And you see that there is uh, uh, some aerobilia with uh, a pus floating uh, in the uh, bile duct. Bile ducts are not uh, so uh, dilated. And uh, uh, of course, we use uh, the uh, 19 gauge uh, needle to uh, to perform the, the the puncture of the of, of the stent. I always uh, aspirate. This is a small trick before to inject uh, to be sure that uh, uh, the the tip of the, the needle is uh, inside the bile duct. Because if uh, uh, you are not sure, if uh, if if you inject, you 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 will have a, a, a very near, uh, very large hyperechoic uh, area, and you you miss uh, you will miss uh, the, the 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 target uh, after. And it's for this reason that I always aspirate before to uh, uh, to inject contrast. Here you see the the contrast inside the bile duct, the insertion of the of the the wire. And after, I think it's very very important to use the. The six French cystostom for us is the, the main uh, the main accessories because uh, with this uh, uh, six ostom there is no need to dilate the puncturing tract for the insertion of the of the stent. Also, you can uh, inject by the the, the, the cystostom to be sure uh, that the the, the cystostom is in a, in a, in a good position. Here you see and the, the, the cystostom. And uh, uh, after we uh, we push the the new Jobor stent here, you see no need to dilate the the, the tract. And uh, you have two markers. The, this first mark here is the junction between the uncovered part and uh, the covered part. And uh, this marker should be. Uh, one centimeter uh, above the, the puncturing tract at the level of the uh, of the bile duct, and to be sure that the uh, if you push too much the the stent inside, you have the risk to cover some side branch like this, and this can induce uh, not uh, every time, but you can induce some uh, uh, hepatic uh, uh, hepatic uh, abscess. And this is the the endoscopic image now. The second trick is to open the stent inside the working channel, uh, like for the lamps, uh, and uh, this also prevents the, the, the risk of uh, of uh, uh, of migration or uh, during the, the deployment of, of the stent. Huh? To open inside the working channel to maintain with the elevator uh, the stent. Here yeah, now we push the scope with the, 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 the catheter, and this is the good the good size. Uh, to have uh, three or four centimeter of uh, stent inside the, uh, the the stomach, and after I leave here uh, in place a double pigtail stent to uh, to uh, prevent the the even the the, the, the migration or a nasocystic drain. Uh, also, to uh, in case of uh, 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 of a patient with uh, uh, a risk of of migration, and here you see the this uh, uh, pigtail stent inserted like this. This, uh, this is a security. This, uh, this stent are, are very important because they have changed. They have changed the, the, the treatment of patients with uh, complex biliary stenosis. And like this is a, a young, young woman with a, a, a central metastasis from an ovarian cancer. Uh, chemotherapy was not possible because the patient has uh, uh, had uh, 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 jaundice, uh, and uh, we decided to do this complex uh, drainage. It was a type four of the bismuth classification. We have inserted uh, uh, two stents endoscopically and two hepaticogastrostomy because the two uh, segment two and segment three were uh, separated. 
And this patient is still alive uh, eight years after the insertion of this uh, two hepatic gastrostomy. Uh, she achieved a complete response at the chemotherapy. And now the, the, the big problem of this patient is the, the recurrence of cholangitis due to the, the obstruction of the, uh, of the, uh, of the stent. Also, for, for this uh, patient with a complex, uh, a complex uh, uh, cholangiocarcinoma, uh, we have drained all the segments endoscopically and with the US route uh, in two sessions. And uh, the, the, the goal is to have a complete drainage of the liver and to start the chemotherapy or radiochemotherapy. It's very important to have a complete drainage because this uh, increases the, the survival rate of, of the patient. And also during the chemotherapy, the complete drainage can prevent some complication uh, like cholangitis or hepatic abscess in case of uh, non, uh, if uh, one or two segments of the, the liver are not drained. What is the future? The future, this is uh, uh, one of my last uh, slides. The future is uh, always to, uh, to be focused on the bill leakage, uh, is to prevent, off to prevent the bill leakage. I think the thing, the first thing is the best selection of the patient. We, we need to discuss a patient with, uh, with ascites, what is the outcome of the patient, what is the, the stage of the tumor, and uh, so on and so on. I think it's very, very important to have a best selection of the patient. For us, the cystostome of six French is uh, the best uh, device to, uh, to, uh, to create the anastomosis between the bile duct and the stomach. And uh, uh, the new design of the Jobor stent should be, and I hope this, uh, could be possible uh, in the near future to, to combine uh, the, the Geobor stent and the SPAC stent like this and uh, uh, 10 centimeter long stent, three centimeter uncovered, seven centimeter covered with the head of the uh, SPAC to prevent the, the migration. Of course, a uh, hot system. This is the, the main interest to have the hot system is to, uh, to uh, reduce the number of manipulation with this kind of, uh, of stent, if it's possible, uh, the, the hepaticogastrostomy will uh, reduce at two steps, the insertion of the wire first, and the second, the insertion of the, of the stent with the, uh, the cuttering part uh, here included in the delivery system uh, of, of the stent. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you are uh, uh, interesting, we organize a, a, a US ando this year due to the, the COVID pandemic, 17, 18 September. And the live case uh, 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 will be, uh, will be uh, uh, sent from my unit uh, uh, into the, the web uh, with uh, some uh, expert, uh, uh, famous expert like Jacques Devier and Guido Costamania. Uh, and Nagi Redi uh, the, in Marseille. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful lecture. Really, really enjoyed how it all began, <laughs> how difficult it was. And the future looks exciting. Future really looks exciting. Um, Pradham, uh, will you take over and uh, ask some questions, any audience questions or anything? We can't hear you. Put on your mic. Yeah, microphone, right there. Micro, your microphone is uh, not open. So, um, um, before Pradham, can, can is your microphone on? Not yet on. Please, my unmute. Yeah, can't hear you. No, no. <laughs> Uh, uh, Mark, this uh, combination of Spexus with uh, uh, Geobor is, is very, very interesting. And, uh, um, I hope that the, the Taiwan company will... Uh, this is an old idea that um, I try to push the Taiwan company to, uh, to try to work on this. Uh, I, I know that it's not, not, probably not easy to, uh, to insert uh, everything into the, into the stand, but I... I think we, the, the main problem of the hepaticogastrostomy sometimes is uh, today we have too much manipulation. Uh, 
the while, the dilation, the stent, and uh, I think uh, we need to, to reduce, like, uh, like the, the insertion of the lamps, you need to, right. to reduce the number of steps, and the reduction of the number of steps will increase the, the safety of the procedure. I, I'm, I'm quite sure. And I hope that, uh, that uh, the people from, uh, from a Taiwan company uh, are connected today and um, to uh, so push the, Moon, this idea. <laughs> Mark, Professor Moon, yeah. John, uh, you did show a case of a SPACS uh, uh, GS. What do you think of the idea of combining uh, SPACS with a uh, GeoBoard? <clears throat> Yes, I already showed the case. It's yes, yes. a similar concept we suggested by uh, Geo, yeah. like a Geo stand modification. Yes. And so we have been worked to develop that kind of stand more than three years ago. So yeah. now the kind of stand is just approved in Korean FDA. So now I'm, we are using it. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. And can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Uh, Oh, 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 Mark, congratulations. Thank you very much. I always uh, love my lecture. And I, I <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, you are the old boss stand done a lot for the world, or mm -hmm. done a lot for the world. Yes, yes. And actually, I have used uh, many of uh, geo ball stand uh, for my patients. And I feel like uh, the problem of the migration back to the stomach is very really mm -hmm. low. That's because mm. of the wonderful uncovered portion in the uh, intrahepatic bile duct, uh, and uh, it, this is in in opposite with the fully covered stent, right? Yeah, and and also the inward migration is also very low, I think, because uh, also because of the uncovered portion. So so then, what's the benefit of adding on the uh, spaces? To prevent I think the be, migration, be, what's the benefit? No, of this? The benefit is uh, could be uh, sometimes you have you have a migration is uh, is uh, during the, the during the insertion of the stent. In, okay. in some, uh, I think, in some um, less experienced uh, endoscopists, there, there are tendency to uh, to uh, to uh, not to to push, to, to, to maintain too much the, the, the stent inside the walking channel and the, the stent has a tendency to, uh, to go inside the, 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 the duct and the, the peritoneum. And, and also, the, this will prevent this kind of, uh, of miss, uh, of, of miss um, insertion. And also, the, the, main the main advantage of this could, we can probably use in patients with fasciitis. Because uh, yes, I see this, uh, the, the, but unfortunately, we, we don't have the, the in Europe. And eh? I, I saw your your, uh, <laughs> uh, and this could be also useful in patients with ascites because the, the, the stent will be uh, will be uh, uh, very well uh, anchored into the into the stomach with no risk of uh, of migration into the into the peritoneum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. This was wonderful. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I saw, I saw. <laughs> thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Moon. Thank you, thank you. And uh, we'll, we'll move on to the next lecture by Professor Miranda, who is going to tell us how to place a geobore stent appropriately. Manolo. Hey, welcome, Miranda. Hi. Hi, can, can you hear me? I'm not if, if I'm silent. Yes, I, I hear you very well in Thailand. Okay, yeah. that's great. Next, uh, let's, let's my slides. Can you see my slide? We can see a lizard back yes. behind. A green lizard. You can see. Uh, you cannot think? see okay. your slide. <laughs> okay. But you cannot see the slide. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Sorry about this. Okay, I'm trying to. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Yes, we can see your slide now. Good. Oh, I did it wrong. Sorry. I should. Have. Okay. Hey. So, uh, so before I start, let me just say this is a real honor to be here at this webinar with the father of 
all these wonderful stems that we love and make our life easier with uh, Mark Giovannini, not only the father of GeoBoar, he's also my father in interventional US because I, I train uh, with him. So I'm, I'm sorry there is some overlap with Mark's lecture, but it's only natural that the sons take after the father. Uh, and also Dr. Kambi Mer, Dr. Takao Itoi, Dr. Nagi. And um, I'm trying to be very practical, show you some videos, but before we get into the videos, uh, this is the ideal features that we all, just, uh, I think, uh, we all like to have in a transmural USB DN. A stand that see to place and placement for a metal stand implies insertion into the target and then deployment. And then uh, the second feature is that the stand is stable. Once it is placed, it stays in place. There is no leakage, no for shortening uh, and no blocking. Uh, and uh, this is related to not only short-term adverse events like leakage, peritonitis, but also long-term patency. So ideally, we would like to avoid uh, long-term issues with uh, ingrowth or reflux or dysfunction of any origin. And then we would like to understand that it's very easy to revise in, in case the patient has any stent dysfunction, we can easily go through the stent and do whatever needs to be done. And uh, the, especially in the case of benign disease, that is still a developing indication for hepatic gastrostomy, there are only preliminary data. Uh, we like not only the ability to do intervention through the stent, but also easy removal. So traditionally, we had the standard uh, metal biliary stents, either fully or partially covered. So uh, this is uh, a partially covered wall, wall stent, one of the earlier versions. And you see the uncovered part is only five millimeters on the inner into the liver side and five millimeter in the gastric side. So in a way, the ID geobore stent really why use the uh, uncovered, covered, symmetrical, but useless design and not change it to, into a more specific for hepatic gastrostomy? And this is the concept of the modified uh, self-expandable metal stents. The geobore designed by uh, Dr. Giovannini is the first one. And as you have seen from his lecture, uh, nowadays the inner part that goes into the liver is uncovered. Now is 30% and the 70% going proximal uh, in stomach is fully. So uh, anchoring is provided with the uncovered part and leakage uh, is prevented with the covered uh, part. Uh, I would like to say that the DAT design or specifically uh, hepatic gastrostomy stent is not, the geobore is not the only one. There are also similar ideas and similar concepts uh, and uh, an and inward anchoring part, anti-migration gastric part, also sometimes coupled with dedicated uh, introducing catheters. This is another uh, interesting design that's also uh, commercially available in Europe there is this uh, dilating uh, piece at the tip of the delivery catheter. There is anti-migration features and, and some uh, uh, studies from Korea. Uh, we see not only the this dedicated stent, it's a small study, very, very small patient number, 16 on each arm comparing this dedicated stand with a standard fully covered. But you see that even if the patient number is very small, the incidence of adverse events, early adverse events is only 6% with this specific uh, design stands versus 31% with the conventional design. Uh, also very interestingly, the uh, procedure time with a dedicated stand is 10 minutes, ranging from five to 12, uh, uh, and with a conventional stent, the same operators had a procedure time 
a medium of 15 minutes between 10 and 17. These are all very expert uh, practitioners, very expert operators, and the procedure time is measured not from the mouth in to mouth out, but from puncture to stent deployment, right? So, uh, what was the most important feature, uh, the most important adverse event uh, that we want to prevent? Marked measure. This is what we want to happen. We don't want the stent migrating uh, from the stomach into the peritoneal cavity uh, right after deployment and, and causing severe peritonitis. And this, uh, of course, this happens with standard biliary metal stents that don't uh, incorporate any anti-migration features. Uh, this is the first reported case 10 years ago by Martins. This is another of uh, Mark's uh, ch children in Brazil. And he was honest enough to publish this complication. You see the stain going beyond the gastric wall into the peritoneum causing severe peritonitis in a patient with uh, unresectable malignancy. This was fatal, but you see, um, the reason why this happens, you can appreciate in this endoscopic image, this is a partially covered uh, wall stent. So it's only five millimeter here. And what you see this stent foreshortens up to 30%. So the stent was originally placed into the stomach immediately after deployment. But you see here some tenting. This is uh, the gastric wall is coming away from the liver surface. And this then, when it's going to expand, it's going to foreshorten. And that's the reason we call this migration, I don't know, but this is not really migration. This is foreshortening of a stem that was probably too short. And this is the things that we learned uh, from the, the hard way with, when we started doing these things. So my question, I, I ask myself, is the geobore um, anti-migration flap uh, inside the stomach strong enough to prevent this phenomenon? I would say maybe, but maybe not. So the best prevention from uh, inward migration is leaving, as Mark has also said in his talk, leaving a very long intragastric segment, maybe minimum three centimeters, three, four centimeters, especially if you are in the earlier phases of your experience. And as we know from studies coming from the United States and Korea, the learning, uh, the learning curve for hepatic gastrostomy involves between 30 and 40 cases. So uh, it means we are all beginners for a long time because hepatic gastrostomy is not uh, such a common procedure. So this is, uh, uh, to be honest, and uh, I told uh, Dr. Deer that I would say this, I've been not using the GeoBoard a lot. I've been using similar stents. So I asked the one company to let me have uh, two stents so that I could, uh, um, uh, play, uh, I could produce videos for this lecture. This is one case that was done July the 31st in our unit. This is a patient with a Ruan Y uh, gastrectomy for a peptic ulcer disease now develops uh, biliary obstruction. You see the EUS guided cholangiogram. And this is one of the features that I would like to point out as a good uh, for a geobore stent. You see the peripheral bile duct is not very much dilated on the, on the left side, which is uh, in a room white patient is the only access that we have for a hyalur stricture. We cannot go to the CBD, we cannot go to the right side, which is a little bit more dilated than the left. So the peripheral left is not dilated. We have to go very close to the confluence. We have to go hilar. And if we use a stent that is not uncovered, we're gonna block off the main branches of the, of, of, of the left side, or we have to leave the stent too short inside the bile duct risking migration to the stomach. So I like this case that just happened to come through the door uh, uh, two weeks ago when I was working and not on vacation to show, look, this is very good to have an uncovered segment here. Now I'm gonna play the video that Dr. Sanchez Ocaña 
edit it for me. Uh, so we get the cholangiogram. The next thing, we want to have as much wire as possible. The wire here is coiling back above the stricture. And you see there is some distance because the peripheral bile duct was not very dilated. As Mark Giovannini said, we like to dilate uh, because otherwise we're going to have trouble in passing the stain. We use the six frame cystitone. And in addition to that, we like to use a balloon. Uh, during dilation, this is what I want to stress, we keep the guide wire into view. In our case, as the, uh, the operator is looking at the fluoroscopy, an assistant is holding the scope and, and looking at the ultrasound so that he or she keeps the wire into view at all times. So once we have the cystotome in place, this is the case here, uh, we can change the wire for a 35 wire. We like to use a 25 visic light. And we balloon dilate twice, once bile duct to liver and then liver to stomach. So sometimes even if the distance is less than four centimeters and we use a four centimeter balloon to make sure you, we dilate at both points, we used to dilate twice. We aspirate to prevent leakage. We advance under EUS and under fluoroscopy you see this angle we have the mark uh, uh, I'm going to go back uh, because this is important we have the uh, radio opaque uh, marker here so we know this is all uncovered and it, there's no problem that this stays inside the bile duct there's, gonna, there's not going to be blockage of main side branches because this is all uncovered and as we deploy we keep track of the stem position sometimes we need to reposition backwards towards the echo the endoscope i forgot to mention uh, mark already did that we always uh, to be on the safe side we need to use at least eight centimeter long and if you are beginning we need you need to use a 10 centimeter long stem because you see there are three centimeters inside the bile duct, three centimeters across in the liver, maybe one centimeter in no man's land between the liver and the stomach, and then three plus three is six, seven. You also like to have three nine centimeters inside the stomach. So even if your measured distance across the liver is maximum of three centimeters, 10 centimeter is okay. It's probably safer to err on the uh, long, uh, on the extra length side than on the uh, too short. So, sorry, I'm going back. Cystotome, balloon dilation, balloon dilate twice, choose an eight or 10 centimeter. And then when you deploy, you need to reposition towards your, um, your endoscope. And there are two choices. One is intra-channel stem release. If you're looking at the fluoro and you have a 10 centimeter stem, you are sure that you have only six centimeter, or then you can push backwards, insufflate, and deploy. And as you see, this is this is super long. This is 10 centimeter, three in the uh, inside the bile duct, uh, three to four across the liver and the stomach and three in the stomach. And this is the way you are not gonna get into any trouble. So this is what I would, the video that I, I've shown you, I call the GeoBoard standard placement. Uh, so to summarize the practical tips, with the GeoBoard, the uh, uncover intrahepatic end gives you the benefit of not having to select a particularly peripheral intrahepatic bile duct branch which if you use a fully cover, you have to be more careful to, to choose. So that's give, that gives you more options. Uh, then uh, the guide wire to avoid friction, uh, as I said, a 0.25 inch guide wire is probably better than a 0.35. And you have to make it either go to the right side, go integrally across the hilar structure, in the case I've shown you, or at least coil backwards into the dilated liver segment so that it gives you stability. 
don't be afraid to delay generously. Uh, we also customarily use the six French uh, sister tone, but we additionally use um, the four millimeter balloon to prevent leakage. What we do is uh, during balloon exchange for the stem delivery catheter, we apply suction all the time uh, to try to get the minimal leakage that happens into the working channel. Then choose a long uh, geobore stand. I would say minimum will be eight uh, and try to leave a long intragastric segment, minimum three centimeters, because sometimes this is not like colonic stenting, esophageal stenting, or even transpapillary biliary stenting at ERCP. Here, one centimeter longer or shorter can be a whole lot uh, different. So length matters a lot and it's better to be uh, slightly longer than uh, slightly shorter. So for the deployment, uh, as I've shown you, uh, we use ultrasound to monitor stem deployment, stem introducing, but also very important to keep your fluoro uh, landmarks, especially the radio peg markers, to avoid the phenomenon that Mark warns, warns us about, that the stem goes inside very rapidly. If you only keep your eye on the EUS, like you might do with a Spaxus, a Nagi, or a Naxios stand, if you only keep your eye on EUS and you disregard uh, fluoro, you, the stand may go inward uh, into the liver unnoticed and you cannot fix it. So, intra-channel uh, deployment has been suggested by Ogura from Osaka as a way to minimize that virtual space that happens between the liver and the stomach, the so-called candy sign. Uh, but sometimes the candy sign happens even if you are aiming for intra-channel. And this is what I'm gonna show you in the next video. Uh, I've shown you an uneventful uh, deployment, uh, an eventful geobore stand placement, and this is what I call geobore placement with adjustment. And this is the second case I did. So it was shortly after July the 31st. Uh, I'm, in theory, I am an expert. And look at what happened here. So, uh, I, I mean, I've done more than 40, which is the learning curve. Again, this is a very similar case. You see not much of a peripheral dilation on the left side. I don't know why, but sometimes these patients have a more dilation in the right side, we could see these uh, very nice, this main bile duct. Use 19 gauge needle, get a cholangiogram, see the stricture. We are getting a 25 wire, uh, some trouble getting to look. We balloon dilate uh, after cystotone passage twice. After we deflate the balloon, we apply suction. So this fluid uh, from the obstructive bile duct uh, goes along the wire into the channel. We deploy distal end until the mark, so the, the radio peg markings are within limits, so we know this is only three centimeters. We try to do intra-channel, we track the stand deployment, we see the marker, look, this is too short. We were aiming for three centimeters into the stomach, and is barely two centimeters here. And look at this nice candy sign that we were hoping to avoid. The second trouble that we come across is the proximal or intragastric end is not opening immediately as it happened in the previous case. So uh, how do we deal with this? What we do is uh, we balloon dilate the stem to see if there is any foreshortening. And if that foreshortening happens, we make it happen right in front of our eyes. So we place uh, uh, the uh, eight millimeter balloon dilator. The second strategy that we use is uh, we place a double pigtail. This is seven French. Of course, if you have the single pigtail, it's much easier to insert. You can cut the first pigtail. And the fourth anchoring strategy that we use or the third, sorry, is clipping. So we clip. Uh, this clip is not going to last forever, but uh, uh, we hope that at least it lasts until the mature fistula 
is created because if we revise, uh, when we revise these patients, like two, three months down the road, if the patient is doing well under palliative chemotherapy and he survives and there is some stent dysfunction, when we look at the clip, the clip has fallen, has fallen off from the gastric mucosa, but at least this does not happen immediately. So this is our um, uh, three extra anchoring strategies. One is balloon dilation to control for any foreshortening. The second is to use um, a, a, a long, this is 10 centimeter, seven French double pigtail, the inner liver pigtail anchors inside. And in case there is any ingrowth here, this is gonna help us find uh, the, um, the ingrown uh, lumen of the, the bile duct and the clipping. So I didn't uh, mean to do this on purpose for this lecture, it just happened. I was trying to show like a nice and eventful placement and this happened. So today, the, what I will call my tips, uh, my additional tips or precautions for the heobor as for any stent, I would say there is no perfect stent. There is no yet a foolproof stent. Of course, if you are doing US, that means you are not a fool. You are a, a physician, you are a trained endoscopist, but you cannot uh, rely blindly that all these built-in automatisms, whatever the name of the stent, I don't want to give any names, but you know, this is gonna work always perfect. You have to keep at the back of your mind always like an alarm, an alertness of anything might go wrong. And it's not the stent's responsibility to make it safe. It is your responsibility. So whatever the stent you use, uh, and I would say this also applies to the gear board, but to any other EUSBD stent, the level of alertness has to be a little bit higher than when placing a stent in the colon, intraluminally, in the esophagus or in the duodenum. My, uh, the extra anchoring maneuver that I've shown in this video, immediate balloon dilation to control for foreshortening, a coaxial double pigtail longer than the original uh, geobore in this case, and then clipping to the gastric wall. So uh, I summarize uh, ideal features of transmural EUSBD stand and my opinion on how they apply to the geobore stand. Easy placement uh, for the geobore stand. I would say it's average. It's not super easy because there is no built-in cautery system or a stiff dilator. Maybe as Mark uh, suggested, this is coming in the future an average deployment. So it's good enough, it's not, um, it's not perfect. So how stable is the stand once it is properly placed? I think this is above average because the uh, migration out uh, from the liver into the stomach, uh, outward migration is prevented by the uncovered part. Uh, I would say the uh, flanges in the stomach are not uh, perfect. Uh, the gastric wall can, you know, patient can retch or the stomachs move. So uh, you need to rely on extra stent length, not rely, it's a nice feature to have. Um, uh, about the long-term patency, I'm not sure about the ingrowth that was reported in Mark's uh, series uh, in, in US that they had some instances of stent ingrowth. Uh, of course, this is the, the trade-off, the price you have to pay to prevent uh, acute leakage, which is a worse complication than delayed stent dysfunction. I would say this can be easily managed in most of uh, the instances by placing another stent inside. If the stent is too long, maybe you can cut it with APC. So I would say that revision for malignant uh, patients is uh, is relatively simple with the geobore stand. Um, it does allow through the stand intervention for malignant patients. I will show you the last example before my talk is finished. Uh, what I'm not sure, I have no experience, I would say removal is not easy. Uh, it's not impossible. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that you can place stent in stent to do away with ingrowth and try removal. 
but it's not a stem that I would use for benign disease. However, sometimes, uh, not only this is an example of uh, through the stem cholangioscopy for retroflex. flex. Oh, See, sorry. yes? We are running very, very late. So if you can... Okay, uh, I finish now. I finish. Yeah, that was my last uh, slide. This is from the same patient, the uh, cholangioscopy. The oncologist was not happy about our presumed diagnosis of malignancy. We didn't see any mass on EUS. And through this geobore stem, we can nicely... So this is, uh, this is the tips uh, that I've, I've told you about. Uh, especially, I would say, long length is the most easy to remember and the most important tip. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manolo. That was a wonderful, wonderful, exhaustive uh, lecture on technique. Thank you. Thank you. You're the welcome. Go My pleasure. Who does, uh, you know, the warnings and the other things. Thank you very much for that. Unfortunately, we can't take any questions because we are uh, running uh, late. So uh, thanks again. Thanks a lot. Um, You're welcome. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, and thank you. You came um, cutting your vacation short, I think, by 20 minutes. No, no, no. I'm still on vacation. Look at the background. This is beautiful Majorca. <laughs> I just had a, um, uh, I hired a cruise, so I, we were cruising on a boat today. But I was in time just to listen to Mark's lecture. And wow. I'm sorry, he's the previous speaker. You made me confess what I was doing. So I'm very close. Uh, I'm very close to Marseille. Eh? Only 200 miles uh, south of Marseille. Thank you. Is is Ken here? Uh, uh, um, um, Kenneth Binmoller? Should we start the next? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, Ken. Hi, hi. Yes, we yes. can see you, but oh, of course we can see you now. So yeah. let's uh, change uh, track and go to Axios. And who better to tell us about how uh, the idea of Axios came about and how the Axios tent was developed than Kenneth Binmoller himself. Ken, um, we are privileged to have you here. Um, please continue. Good. Let me see. Uh, can you see my screen right now? Yes. Just Okay, perfect. Let me go to... Good. And now you've got the slide full screen? Yes. Yes, perfect, perfect. All right, good. So coming in color, color view. I don't know what is that. The color panel. Can you re remove it from the screen? Color panel. Yeah, we are seeing a color. We had the same problem in Takao's presentation also. Okay, so I'm not sure. Let me see. I've got an IT guy here. Who maybe can help. June, are you here? Um, I'm not sure what that color panel is. Okay, you are not seeing it. I'm not seeing it, no. Continue then, let's see. All right, so hopefully you can see the entire uh, slide. Yeah. Um, all right, good. So, uh, firstly, Vinny, uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to contribute to this. I think this is uh, in an in inaugural, a premiere, in terms of a seminar dedicated to EUS uh, stents. Uh, stents that are specifically designed for EUS interventions. And I think that has been such a major breakthrough uh, that we have uh, seen over this past decade. And so uh, we're, uh, go of course, going to see so many uh, new and future uh, breakthroughs in this space. Um, but I feel very privileged to uh, be part of the momentum uh, of this new frontier. So my thanks for the uh, invitation. And I'm going to actually take you on a, maybe a, a personal journey here in terms of the idea of the LAMS uh, and uh, how it was developed and uh, comment on future directions. Okay, let's see. I, uh, there we go. Um, you know, our partnership with industry is so critical for the advancement uh, of our specialty, uh, interventional endoscopy. Uh, but it's important that, of course, we are always transparent about conflicts of interest. So I, I am a proud parent uh, of Axios, and uh, Boston Scientific became the adoptive parent for uh, Axios uh, after Exlumina handed it over to them. 
uh, but I don't have any royalty or equity stake in Axios. So I just want to be clear that uh, I'm, I'm entirely neutral and uh, I am uh, interested solely as a practitioner to see our field uh, advance, no matter who we work in partnership with. Um, much of my talk is in uh, a chapter that I wrote uh, or a contribution that I made uh, for an inaugural issue of Techniques and Innovations in Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. It's a journal of the AGA, and Anthony Teo invited me to contribute uh, this first inaugural uh, issue chapter, and uh, Anthony is the uh, co-editor for this uh, first issue. So the title of this paper is Design Considerations of the Axial Stent and Electrocautery Enhanced Delivery System. So if you're interested, feel free to look at this article, which captures uh, much of what you're, you will hear about in my presentation. So I've been really blessed to have personally witnessed the evolution of the US starting as a pure imaging modality uh, with using the radial scanning echo endoscope. That's how I started doing EUS when I joined Nipsa Henders unit in 1991. And it evolved very quickly to an interventional uh, modality with the ability to do FNA. And the therapy, our ability to do EUS guided therapeutic interventions, that's of course where all the excitement is. And of course, this is thanks to the development of the linear array echo endoscope. So therapy started uh, for me, because uh, I think of FNA really as still an extension of diagnosis. So therapy started in Hamburg in 1992. We had a patient with a non-bulging pseudocyst. We were draining pseudocysts endoscopically, but uh, we could only drain the bulging pseudocysts. And we had a patient with a non-bulging pseudocyst, and we started thinking outside the box in terms of how we might be able to drain this pseudocyst under EUS guidance. And we fortunately had one of the very first prototypes of the Pentax echo endoscope the CLA echo endoscope with a 2.0 millimeter channel. So we punctured this uh, pseudocyst with a uh, home fashioned uh, device really, and we passed a wire uh, through it. Uh, we needed cautery to get into the pseudocyst, and then we did an over the wire exchange for the 4.2 millimeter duodenoscope. And from here, it's basically like ERCP. We dilated the tract, and then we placed a 10 French pigtail stent. And so that was, the first report of EOS guided drainage of a pancreatic uh, pseudocyst in 1992, published in GIE. So we adopted from our radiology colleagues the Sodinger technique. It's the over the wire technique. And uh, you're all familiar with this because this is how we had been draining pseudocysts uh, historically. We access the cyst with an FNA needle. We insert a wire into the cyst, allow it to coil a few times. Now we have a platform to railroad our coaxial instruments over the guide wire. We dilate the track. We can use a balloon. We can use a bougie. And then we drain the cyst with one or more plastic stents. But we soon realized that we endoscopists encountered challenges that our radiology colleagues really did not face to the same degree at least, because we're working from a much further distance from our target. So we were performing multiple over the wire device exchanges and in that process we could lose access to our wire. And this was very tedious and time consuming working over this long distance. But more importantly, there was always a step off between the guide wire and the catheter device. And this step off created difficulties for us to traverse the wall, the bowel wall, and get into the target lumen, especially when that wall was fibrotic as it is, for example, for a, a pseudocyst. And we realized that the Sondinger technique, as elegant and uh, revolutionary as it was, it is a multi-step technique in which with each of these steps, we take a, 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 a risk. And that risk uh, starts with um, the removal of our needle, leaving our guide wire in place. Because when we remove that needle, 
leaving the guide wire, we now have a gap between the guide wire and our track. And this is where the leak actually starts, just with the removal of our FNA needle. When we dilate our tract to enable insertion of our stamp later, we can displace our target uh, lumen if it's not firmly adherent to the bow wall. And this dilation itself can result even in perforation, into frank perforation. When we remove our dilator, again, we have that gap between the guide wire and our dilator resulting in leak. And even when we place our stent, if it's not an adherent target lumen, we can displace that lumen uh, away. And without question, the greatest fear was that we would cause perforation, frank perforation with leakage of intestinal contents into the peritoneal space. We also realize that there are many technical challenges using our conventional tubular stents for transluminal drainage. So these tubular stents have a tubular configuration. After all, they are designed for lumen recanalization. There's no lumen to lumen apposition. The ends project into both of the lumens. When we use plastic stents, the double pigtail stents, these have a small fixed diameter. So there can be leak around the stent itself. There is that gap between the stent and the tract diameter. If we place multiple stents, we have to place multiple guide wires, and this entails multiple steps. When we use metal stents, we address the problem of reducing the risk of leak with the covered SEMS, but we then realized we have the risk of maldeployment and migration because these metal stents are tubular in configuration. Perhaps just totally captured in our enthusiasm that we could go through the bowel wall and we could access extra intestinal uh, structures, we didn't fully realize that every time we do a transluminal intervention, we are creating an intentional perforation. So we get away with that with impunity when that target lesion is adherent to the bowel wall. But if it's not adherent, so for example, the gallbladder here, and you can see this echogenic layer interposed between the gallbladder and the bowel lumen, the duodenum, this gallbladder is not adherent. This is fat tissue between these two lumen structures. And when the patient goes to surgery, we again see that open space between the two lumens of the gallbladder and the duodenum. So what we have lacked are the tools dedicated for transluminal therapy, because all of our innovation has been in the lumen, and now we're thinking outside the lumen or through the wall with EUS guidance. We were this plumber here who is using his finger to plug the hole in the bathtub. And his wrench in the back pocket here isn't going to do a lot. And um, I was perhaps this child here who is asking, where are your tools? Because we need tools to prevent that risk of leak and perforation that sometimes could be even fatal. So we needed, in my opinion, two tools. Firstly, we needed a transluminal stent, what we today call a LAMS. It needs to be covered and self-expanding to seal off the tract. Should be lumen opposing, and it should provide a port for transluminal intervention. This port for transluminal, transluminal intervention is so critical if we truly want to extend the reach of the endoscopist to the extraintestinal space. But we also need a transluminal stent delivery system that is designed to eliminate Seldinger, to eliminate over the guide wire exchange. We need to be able to access the target lumen with a stent loaded uh, catheter. So here you can see some diagrams of some of the uh, concepts uh, which I uh, patented very uh, early on as I thought about ways that we can accomplish safer and, and uh, more efficient transluminal therapy. So the LAMS concept uh, was filed in 2008. This is from the abstract. 
a device whereby two luminal structures in the body may be drawn toward each other and a fluid conduit formed in between. Here you can see one of the embodiments that I came up with. It looks different from the Axios, of course, but the concept is shown here how the two flanges are pulling the walls of these two lumens in at position and holding them together. So this evolved to the Axios lambs with four key features. It, it consists of a self-expanding nitinol mesh. It has anchoring double-walled flanges. It has a very short one centimeter saddle that's designed to traverse just the two walls. And it has full silicon uh, coating. Now, a parent, of course, spends a lot of time thinking about a great name for its, uh, its newborn. So I thought a long time about a name that captures the spirit and the essence of the lambs. So I came up with the name Axios, which captures two things. First of all, it's, it's axial introduction, which is how we work endoscopically. And it is creating an anastomosis, an ostomy. So we are creating a transluminal anastomosis Axial ostomy, os is opening so that we can also go through this os into the extraintestinal space, axios. And it so happens that axios is also the name of a famous Greek god called axios, and it is in Greek mythology the river god. How befitting for the name of a device that enables the flow of contents from an extraintestinal structure like a pseudocyst or the gallbladder into the bowel lumen. So in 2008, uh, I founded uh, Exlumina uh, that many of you in the audience probably uh, worked with or, or know of. Um, so it started uh, just a few miles away from my hospital here in San Francisco with a mission to develop tools for EOS guided uh, intervention. We needed these tools and to go beyond, to go beyond into the extraintestinal space with advanced transluminal uh, therapy. X outside the lumen, X lumina. And uh, this is how we started. Uh, we I brought on a CEO uh, to basically get the funding for the company. Um, and this is Michael Allen. And uh, these are some of our engineers, brilliant. Here is Tom DeSimio. Many of you have worked with Tom. Tom was my sidekick nurse at California Pacific for uh, many years, and uh, I was able to recruit him to become the trainer and my sidekick working as the CMO at Exlumina. So when you develop a new device, and I learned all of this by osmosis, really, by doing, uh, there are basically four med tech stages. So the first stage is proof of concept. This is the design and development of your concept. And it starts with benchtop prototyping and simulation on the benchtop. Then once you have that checked off, you go to the animal study. So you want to use live tissue. After you have your final design, so the design is, quote, frozen, so it's locked down you go to what's called VNV. So VNV is verification and validation. So this is actually quite an arduous process because this is the requirement for submission to regulatory, to the FDA, for example. So verification focuses on the product itself. So you go back and you do more benchtop studies to verify. The validation is far more expensive that's where we're focused on the user, the operator, who is using the Axios device. These are our clinical studies. Then you submit to regulatory, the FDA, uh, to get your clearance um, or your approval, depending on whether it's a 510K or it's a PMA. Now they have something called a 510K de novo, that's what Axios was, which is a grant. Uh, the CE mark is the other regulatory agency that you know about. And finally then, when the FDA and the CE gives you the green light, you can move to the commercial launch. And that commercial launch, by the way, obligates the company to follow the outcomes 
for six to 12 months afterwards. So you do a post-market survey and registry to confirm that your device indeed is doing what it's intended to do, but most, most importantly, that it's safe. So bench type prototyping is without question the most arduous. Here you can see what we set up for our bench top uh, work here. So we worked in this room exclusively um, over many, many months. And here were our goals and our solutions for our lamps. We want lumen apposition, but we don't want that to be so excessive that it results in ischemia. We want to avoid ischemia. The solution was a large flange surface area. We want this lambs to resist migration, but we also want it to be removable. The solution was a double walled flange construction. It needs to be compressible for axial introduction but after its deployment, when we pull out back the sheath, it needs to resume its intended original shape, the lamb shape. So it has to resume that shape fully after deployment. So we found out this needs a 48 night null wire braid. And finally, we needed coating that is uniform and is durable, and yet it needs to be thin, and flexible and conforming. So to find that sweet spot is really no easy task. And we tried many different methods how to coat the lambs. You can use dipping methods. Uh, you can do, as you can see here, manual brushing onto the lambs itself. And we found that the manual brushing uh, worked best. And we found that silicon was the best material for the lambs. So just to give you an example, looking for the optimal flange design, it goes through many, many stages until you come up with that flange design that works. So here you can see one of the very first embodiments or designs, and actually these are two halves that are uh, merged together, that are joined together in the middle here. You can see there's no lip here, with the advantage that you don't have anything projecting out, but this really did not have the pullout force that we wanted. So this got modified to adding this lip uh, component here, but now we are increasing the length and these ends may project into the lumen and may cause tissue trauma. So then we had to coat this with a special coating to protect it, these uh, bare wire ends from injury. So just an example of the stages that one goes through until you actually find the optimal design, which is double walled. It, the flanges are 90 degrees to the saddle and the flanges need to be twice the lumen diameter. They have to have a very large surface and a construction that evenly distributes the pressure over that surface area. And it then needs to have that lip, which you see here, to optimize the pullout uh, force. Now, you go to simulation next with benchtop models, and our engineers constructed such a simulator. You can see two frames. These two frames are mobile against each other uh, to simulate the bowel wall and an extra intestinal wall which is non-adherent. So these slide against each other. And then we have a membrane here, it's silicon, that simulates tissue. So it would be the gallbladder wall, for example, or the bowel wall. So here you can see in this video quickly how we're able to penetrate through that first wall and enter through the second wall, deliver the distal flange, snug it up against that distal wall, we can see how it pulls that mobile uh, frame up uh, uh, against the first frame, and then we can deploy this and we can pass an endoscope through it. So once we have determined that this works in a benchtop simulator, we can go to the animal studies. Of course, with a rigorously designed uh, protocol. And uh, you can see here the gallbladder of the pig and we're introducing our labs. You can see the distal flange here. You're all familiar with these types of images now. We can pass our scope through the lambs without displacing it. We can go into the gallbladder. We can visualize the interior of the gallbladder. 
I was seeing the interior of the gallbladder for the first time in my life. So you can imagine how exciting it was to do this for the first time. And we then followed the lambs after implant over many, many weeks, showing that there was no injury to the wall, no inflammation, no necroses, and that the lumen remained pat patent. And then on necropsy afterwards, in these survival animals, you can see the, uh, the, the, the two ends. And then this was published in 2011, um, uh, basically validating the uh, animal results. The verification testing is where you focus on the product specs. And the question is, did you design the product right? So it's all about the product itself. You test the biomechanics. What's the pullout strength? What's the radial strength? Does it do what it's intended to do? And you want to test biocompatibility to make sure that it won't get rejected. All the materials are biocompatible. And just as an example, this is a tensimeter. This tensimeter is used to measure the pullout str strength. So the anti-migration strength, and it showed that the axial stent had five, four greater pullout strength compared to the wall stent. So that's, you have to always use something that exists in the commercial space to compare it to. The radial uh, strength was less, so that was the compromise at the expense of radial strength. Strength. The wall stand had twofold the radial uh, strength, which is one reason why we recommended that you balloon dilate the lumen after placing the stent if you want to get more rapid drainage. Sterilization and shelf life is also part of the verification testing. So you have to show that your packaging is meets all of the regulatory requirements. The validation testing then follows. This is about the user interface. Did you design the right product? It's not about the, was the product done right? Now it's about, is it the right product for the user? So it starts with the indications for use, the instructions for use and the labeling, the physician training requirements. The physician must understand what the indications and contraindications are and all the warnings on its use step by step. Then you go to the clinical studies. You have to define the requirements. Then you can do the first in man. And finally, you do a registry study, which is multi-center to document safety and efficacy. And very quickly, the first in man, we were very fortunate to be able to team up with Takao and in, uh, at his center in Tokyo, 20 patients, 10 pseudocysts, five gallbladders. Of course, a testimony to Takao's skill, 100% technical and clinical success, transluminal interventions, in seven of these uh, uh, patients without complications, stents removed without complications. So this is really the clinical proof of concept now, and then follows the registry. So this is the really expensive part to do the registry study, multi-center, and we, had, we enrolled 33 patients, seven centers, six in the US, one in Europe, 22 months um, uh, follow-up, and technical success rate was 91%. Clinical success also very high complications here. So all of this was reported then. Uh, Rod Shaw took the lead in the publication. My name is not on there uh, because of conflict of interest. Um, this led to the FDA clearance in 2014. So this was the, uh, the breakthrough in terms of becoming available for use in the United States. So we talked about the LAMS. But equally important is the transluminal delivery system, obviously less critical if you have an adherent target organ, but for something like the gallbladder, very critical. And this should be a system that is one step, one single device, and fully exchange free. In other words, we are eliminating cell danger. We access the target lumen with the device loaded catheter, and we immediately deploy the device without any guide wire exchange. So an exchange-free delivery system, as elegant uh, as it sounds, is very challenging. Um, we can use bougies, but we know that it may push the wall, the target lumen away, because it's hard to penetrate through the wall. We may displace the target balloon. Same problem with wall penetration. We can get perforation and bleeding when we dilate. We can use a blade, and we can incise, but we risk bleeding. 
and we can use electrocautery. We often have to resort to electrocautery when the above doesn't work, but we burn a hole in the wall, and that's an unforgiving hole. It's not going to close spontaneously, um, and there's the collateral thermal uh, injury. So these are all of the challenges that one faces. So uh, I came up with different concepts. At first, I thought it needs to be a multi-layered uh, system whereby we have to create counter traction to make sure we don't push our target lumen uh, away. So I came up with uh, this concept of the dog bone balloon. So you can see the first step is the FNA puncture, and then we can pay, uh, we can then over that FNA needle we can advance our balloon. Now this balloon, you'll see when it dilates, it takes on a dog bone configuration. That's the configuration that we're going to use when we deploy our stent, which comes as our third layer. So this is a three layer system. So now the third layer is just a tubular stent, but the balloon gives it that dog bone configuration. So this was you know, one, one way that this could be done. And you can see its resemblance to Axios. Now this is another concept that I had which is a two-layered system using a switch blade to gain entry. You can see that this blade flips up as soon as the trocar advances outside of the sheath. Some of you who use Navix may be familiar with this because this was the platform for that. But you can see in this cartoon how this is performed. The echoendoscope now is positioned across from the gallbladder. We see that under EOS guidance, of course. Now you can see they're not adherent. We puncture through with the switch blade um, and we create that three millimeter opening and immediately inflate a balloon and retract to create counter traction. So this is our retraction to keep that gallbladder wall snug up against the bowel wall and then we can deploy the distal flange and the proximal flange and then we can also dilate that tract. So that's another concept. This is a third concept called the cutter dilator uh, we were very excited about this at one time. You see the needle. You can see we used a different kind of anchor, which is a cage that opens up like this, four-pronged cage. Here's a cutter dilator blade that can be activated to make a cut and incision for the desired diameter to deploy your axial stent. So here you can see the cage, the cutter wire here after it's advanced, it's activated. Then we pull back the cage. It engages into the little slots keeping our, our wall hugged up in that position with the bow wall and then axials. So these are all the concepts. But where it finally ended after you know, countless months, really it was years of trial and error, is the electrocautery enhanced delivery system, what we call hot axials. Now we had of course tried cystotones in the animal lab. The problem was the extensive thermal injury, the collateral damage, and that I didn't like, but our engineers came up with this concept of incorporating microwires just along the edge. These are radially opposed and they converge towards the tip. There's another microwire at the very tip where the guide wire can come out. So you're all familiar with this. This is a ceramic bougie tip to give it the force, the uh, solidity to uh, optimize your forward advancement, your trackability of your uh, device as you penetrate through. So we're minimizing the cautery effect um, and we are maximizing the cutting effect. So really this works really like a, a blade, um, uh, like a knife, uh, rather than as a cautery uh, device. When you deploy a LAMS that's one centimeter in length, obviously there is absolutely no room for error. This must be so precisely delivered. But the good news is we are used to single operator, single hand control when we do FNA. So we're simply applying that where the, uh, the, F, the handle lure locks uh, as we uh, are used to, and then we do a two-stage release of each flange independent of one another. And that was so critical that these two stages are independent of one another and that you verify that the distal flange is correctly deployed and hugged up against the wall of your target lumen before 
you deploy the proximal uh, flange. So we built in all sorts of safety measures to ensure that this is uh, delivered accurately and safely, even with adding labels and numbers one, two, three, and four to remind the endoscopist of these four really simple steps. Because of time constraints, I'm not going to go uh, show you this video because I think everyone in the audience is familiar with the four steps uh, of the LAMS uh, delivery. So the LAMS is not just about a lumen opposing metal stent to prevent leakage and perforation. More important, I think, in terms of the future direction is it's a port for endotherapy. So this has been demonstrated so beautifully by Anthony Teo and his team in Hong Kong, and they reported back in 2016 on how they could use the Axios as a port to enter into the gallbladder, and you can do really everything you can do in the lumen. And obviously you can do a lithotripsy in there under direct endoscopic guidance, and you can, it could be mechanical, it could be electrohydraulic, but you can do magnifying endoscopy, confocal, microscopy. Um, you can do EUS with mini probes. Um, really, there, the, there's no limit because you have extended the reach of the endoscopist into this extraintestinal structure. So the applications right now have been focused on these two extraluminal structures. First, our pancreatic biliary. We have pancreatic applications for cyst enterostomy, um, and we have gallbladder drainage, uh, cholecystoenterostomy. We have bile duct drainage, cholodocal enterostomy. You've all heard about these. What we're hearing more about, and I think is the topic of a future webinar, is are the enteric applications to create a gastroenterostomy, and in patients who have a bypass stomach who have had a, a prior gastric bypass to create a gastro gastrostomy, the what we call the edge procedure to enable ERCP. But what's ironic is that a device that was designed for EOS guided delivery because we had no such device and we were using tubular stents off the shelf in a um, uh, in an off-label application. Now we're using Axios off-label for luminal interventions to treat pyloric stenoses and short strictures such as anastomotic uh, strictures. So I'll end with uh, future directions, and I think I'm right on time now. Um, really, it's all of you in the audience that will carry the baton, um, carry the torch forward. Uh, this is a platform. It is not intended for the treatment of any specific disease or any specific function. It is a platform that can be applied throughout the gastrointestinal tract. So wherever our endoscope can go, we can apply the LAMS a platform. And as you can see in this list, pretty much every organ of the body is accessible through the GI tract. It is literally the window to all the major uh, organs. So I'm gonna leave you with two quotes um, that beautifully captures thinking outside of the box. And of course, this legendary thinker uh, is best known for thinking outside the box, who said, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. And we face so many years of difficulty performing pseudocyst drainage, I certainly did, and that inspired the development of LAMS. If you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. So that's why we have to have the courage to, to plow these new frontiers um, to create that fertile soil for uh, innovation. And we need industry uh, to do this, uh, but at the same time, we also want to always put our patients first. Thank you so much again for the opportunity to contribute. Fantastic, Ken. Uh, it is, uh, I must confess, it is extremely rare that we hear such inspiring lectures. Uh, we are really privileged to have uh, heard this from you. It was really, really great, inspiring, and very, very informative. Uh, 
Um, yes, brother. Anything you have to say? I just want to say and thank you. Very good. Very nice lecture, Bin. My pleasure. Thank, thank you so much. And um, I, I apologize uh, if there was some problem with, uh, hopefully you were able to see the slides okay. It looks great on my screen, but uh, we're all learning this together, how to do our, do our meetings virtual. We saw the hard work that was put through um, several years in the development of this wonderful stent. And yeah, and that changed the world. It's, it, it needed to, it, it's really a um, fantastic stent and going places, but the hard work behind it is, um, I got to know first time today and I'm, I'm really very, very impressed. Fantastic work. It Two. was a, a decade of my life. I spent a decade working on this. It all started 2008 and um, patents were filed much earlier because that had been brewing in my mind uh, years earlier. But uh, 2008 is when officially I was able to get the funding uh, through Ex Lumina to really take a concept that was just a napkin drawing, literally, and uh, then make it uh, an actual device that today I'm using in my hands. So that there's really nothing more gratifying than to know that you can create something from nothing that starts just with an inspiration. And I hope that's the message everyone in the audience is getting. The inspiration is so important. We're the ones in the trenches. We know what our patients need. The engineers need, must follow our instruction, our marching orders. We know what our patients need, and but we need their partnership, obviously, because we're not, uh, we're not engineers, and we're certainly not entrepreneurs. I leave that to others as well. We're in the business of medicine uh, and uh, healthcare. So, um, Ken, uh, those eight years, uh, was this done in your extra time, or did you sacrifice your clinical practice also? So I did take one day of the week. Monday was my ex lumina day, and I was in Mountain View uh, with the engineers in the lab, on the weekends, we actually did the animal lab studies because that was, uh, so talking to Simeo, by the way, he was always cursing because I worked him very hard during the week. We worked, uh, did ERCPs till midnight. And then on the weekends, we were in the animal lab. And uh, I can't tell you how many animals I, I really lived in that animal lab, but it was so important to get that experience and understand the hurdles before then going to patients. So yes, uh, I sacrificed some of my time, but the one thing I did not do, by the way, because I was invited to do that, uh, which is the only way if, you, if your intention is to retire on your cruise ship. Manolo is going on a cruise. I hope he's, uh, he's, he's the only one, <laughs> but otherwise, please wear a mask. Um, if, if you, if you want to have your own cruise ship, well, then you become a full-time entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to stay a doctor, as I did, then um, you'll get diluted out completely. That's just the way the game works. Uh, but it's okay because at least somebody is, Ellis is paying for it. In the beginning, you're paying for everything. And that only can go so long, right? When you file the patents yourself and so forth, it's coming out of your pocket. You can't continue that. So this is the way you got to think of it. If you find a way for someone else to pay for it, that's amazing. And the goal of the doctor is I want to get to the finish line I want a product that I can use in my hands in my lifetime. So, so yes, I stayed in the interventional endoscopist four days a week. Fantastic. Too good. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I don't think there can be any questions on this uh, lecture. It's, it's been a marvelous lecture. Um, and now, hear from Amrita, how we use Axios as in a practical tip. Thanks, Vinay. Yes, I'm here. Can you um, can you hear me and see me? I uh, see my slides. Yes, yes, yes. Wonderful. Yes, we well, can. first of all, and thank you again for the invitation, and um, really congratulations to the organizers for this great concept. I mean, it's such a treat to get to hear a little bit of the thinking of all of these innovators um, uh, that spoke today and a peek into their minds. Um, and it's definitely inspirational, particularly in this time when we've had a lot of time to think about what we need and, and maybe what we can 
develop in the future. So um, Vinay asked me to keep it pretty basic, and, and so that's what I'm going to do today. Um, Ken, I thank you for in inventing this uh, device. It's certainly become um, one of my favorites, and I love um, to talk about how to use it and um, practical tips. So this is a, this is a, a nice tr treat for me as well. Um, and it, it's really just going to, I'm going to um, uh, focus on basically the steps of deployment, um, because I think that's really what most people kind of have questions about. And once you get that down, then you can think creatively of how to use it for all the indications. Um, and, you know, I'll just go over a few things, but really this was um, discussed in the entire, in sort of how we saw this stent develop. Um, Clearly, uh, we're taking advantage of the fact that it's a fully covered stent, so it's going to help us um, prevent some of the complications of going across lumens. The lumen, uh, the opposing aspect of it will allow us to prevent migration um, and really pull together um, uh, lumens with, with potential spaces between them, which has never had never been done before. Um, it's as you know, both in a cautery enhanced and, an, and a cold version. Um, and I think the cold version um, is not what I'm going to talk about and is used in some more of the off-label tech uh, luminal um, indication. So we'll focus on the cautery enhancement and what that allows us to do. Um, commercially, it's available in multiple sizes in the US 10, 15, and 20 millimeters, um, but in Europe, and I don't know about Asia, it is available in smaller sizes as well for a lot of the pancreatic obiliary EUS work um, and access. And I think what's really important is that it can be performed wire guided, but now more so freehand. And this freehand aspect of it is really just made possible by the cautery enhancement and I think has made a world of difference and um, really is sort of my go-to method, and I think of most of the experts that you um, hear on today's panel and, and elsewhere. Um, it can also, because it's really the first of its kind where it's specifically made for EUS, as, as Ken mentioned, we know what we need for our patients and what our procedures. And so for the first time, all the components of it are visualized by EUS. So the placement can be by EUS alone and doesn't necessarily require um, fluoroscopy or switching to an endoscopic view. Um, although there are um, certainly mechanisms in place and markers to do so if that's the way you choose to or, or need to for certain types of procedures. Um, and uh, again, because of this large diameter that we're instantly creating, um, we can go on to do further work um, that you saw in some of the, similar to the stents that you've seen in some of the other talks. Um, so just to focus a little bit on that tip, um, because I think it's really important to understand what's happening when you think about the different st uh, steps. Um, as he mentioned, this ring here at the very edge is the actual cautery portion along with the two wires that run along the side of, the, um, of that conical tip there. And that's important to think about because this is where your axis is going to be created. And the, the tip itself is about a three French tip, and then it dilates up to a 10, a 10 plus French catheter. So again, here is your needle in terms of consolidating your Selden check needs. It's your needle access, it's your fistula creation, your dilation, and then ultimately your stent um, introducer insertion and deployment um, all in one. So, Again, the important thing to think about um, here is with this tip, you really want to have on FOSS contact between the ring and the tissue in order to maximize the cautery that's going to really create your access. Similarly, you think about that these wires are continuing to, to create, to burn through. So it's important that that um, contact continues smoothly as you go through the lumen the, the muscle wall itself, as opposed to sort of just a quick um, spurt on the cautery because you won't actually create your access. It's also important to think about when you think about going through multiple lumens, not just a, a fluid collection. So from the um, duodenum into the gallbladder or from the stomach into um, the, the jejunum or, or the duodenum, 
that this cautery tip needs to make contact with each muscle layer, not just the first one, and then it creates dilation. So you have to think about that a little bit as you're inserting and simultaneously applying cautery um, during the placement. And if we look here, this is the covering of the stent, um, which is in an elongated state. And just like any of our other covered um, stents uh, that we deploy, and it's important to know that the, the black mark is where sort of the flange is. And so if you are going to look endoscopically to deploy, uh, for example, the second flange, this black mark is the indicator of where that flange is and where if you're appropriately positioned. Um, and so uh, just to mention again, um, it is feasible to do this without fluoroscopy because each of these components are visual, can be visualized by EUS. So, um, so Ken mentioned that it's four steps and that is traditionally how it's taught. It's certainly how it's marked on the catheter but I would actually argue that there are five steps and that has to do with sort of evolution of how we have recommended or how it's been recommended that uh, for optimal deployment of the um, stent under EUS guidance and a particularly deployment of the second flange. Um, so the first um, step is going to be your actual access and the entry of the catheter system into the collection. Um, and that's going to be a combination of getting this catheter out of the scope, putting it up to the burst lumen wall, burning your way through or getting through the, the actual lumen, and then advancing far enough into the collection that or space that you will be sure to be deploying the stent within the collection itself. That's all contained in that first step. And what's important to think about also is that um, a lot of the times when I'm teaching this is the part that's important to understand is what's happening up here at the handle. When you have an understanding of that, it can make deployment um, much easier. So I break the handle up into two parts, the bottom half and the top half. The bottom half I call the catheter portion of the handle and the top half I call the stent portion. In terms of the steps, the first step will involve this catheter portion or the bottom half of the handle. The second step is the deployment of the first flange. And that will be done again with the top half of the handle. And then the third step is going to be creating that apposition and pulling the catheter back into place so that you can make sure that the second flange will be deployed on the luminal side of your, uh, on the, uh, within the lumen. And so again, this has to do with movement of the stent. So it has to do with movement of the catheter. So it will have to do with the bottom half of the, of the handle. The third, uh, the fourth step is the deployment of the second flange. Um, and again, that has changed in terms of the way that we have um, recommended um, doing so. Currently, the, the, the optimal way to do it is EUS guided, which means within the channel of the scope itself. Um, and I'm gonna show videos of all of these steps, so bear with me. But again, this will have to do with the top half of the handle because it has to do with the stent, it's the deployment of the stent itself. And then this last step that I'm sort of adding in is actually getting the deployed stent out of the scope and making sure that you've done so, so you're not at risk of pulling out the entire stent and um, uh, defeating the purpose of placement. Um, and so this fifth step, again, is involving um, moving the catheter and even using the catheter as a pusher. And so we'll kind of focus on the bottom half of the handle. So I'll just focus on a few tips for each of these steps. Um, the first step, again, being the entry of the catheter across the lumen wall. This is gonna be done under EUS guidance. Um, when you think about, and again, I'll show this in the video, but that angle, you really want it to be perpendicular to, to um, your wall through which you're accessing. And this is true for any type of EUS guided um, procedure uh, and any, any type of particularly for Axios placement, whether it's for a, a walled off collection or gallbladder or even a GJ. Um, as has been mentioned before, with all these methods, you want to check the Doppler to detect vessels in the wall to prevent um, intraprocedural bleeding. 
Um, and then, then is when you're gonna begin these steps. So the first step is to unlock the catheter just to allow you to be able to move it into place. You see the catheter come out and you tense the tip of the catheter to mucosa. What does that do? That really allows you to ensure that the ring of cautery is, is maximally up against the mucosa at a good angle and will allow for you to have quick cautery access into the um, area of choice. Then you make sure your cautery is uh, attached. I apologize for the sirens. Um, and you check your settings, um, which on an Irby unit, for example, are an, is auto cut 100, effect five. Um, you then, this is, and this is really the important part, is to advance the catheter slowly and steadily while applying that cautery. You don't want to do a jab the way that we do sometimes with sampling, an FNA, where it's a, a quick, a, a quick puncture with a needle. Um, you really want that to go in slowly in order again for that ring of cautery to have enough time to, to apply and, and create access. Once you're inside, you take your foot off the cautery, but the step one is not over. You still want to advance the catheter far enough in in order to make sure that your stent will be properly deployed, the flange will be properly deployed within the collection. And so this here is um, kind of a video I created. So just to keep in mind, the EUS video procedure is not the same as the um, room view um, video, but um, this is kind of the best I could deal with and working with my um, uh, sort of amateur video skills. But just to focus on what's happening here simultaneously here, and it just also emphasizes that these are the exact same steps regardless of what type of um, axios placement you're gonna do, whether it's rectal in this case, or transrectal in this case, or um, walled off necrosis, um, pancreatic necrosis in this case. So this is step one. The first thing that's happening is you're unlocking the catheter. You're now focusing on the bottom half of the handle and bringing the catheter out here, you see it. We make, we um, then attach the cautery to be ready to puncture through and then create a good angle, so perpendicular, and then it's a quick um, hit of the cautery and a, again, continuing to advance that catheter all the way in. And um, one thing that I can just uh, sort of re-show here is that you wanna make sure that the catheter goes all the way in enough so that it's at least um, a thumbs width uh, within a, with the distance between here and here is no more than a thumb's width apart. And that really tells you that you have enough catheter in. Um, so for step two, um, you have deployment of the first phalange. Again, this is all under EUS guidance. Um, it's important to make sure here that your catheter portion of the handle is locked because you don't want inadvertent um, uh, movement of the stent into the collection. You're gonna remove the yellow safety tab. You're focusing on the top half of the handle. You unlock the stent lock, and then you're bringing the, um, the uh, uh, knob up to the position number two until it clicks, at which point the stent will lock automatically. So again, to take that um, into the video, this is taking the safety handle off, then unlocking the stent, and here you see the stent starting to deploy as you're bringing the gray up to the number two and then it clicks in place and then this locks automatically. Just to show that one more time, safety off, unlock, unlocking the handle, bringing it up and then you see this, um, the flange start to deploy. Again, number three, Step three has to do with the catheter again and creating the apposition, which means moving the, um, bringing the uh, catheter up and the deployed uh, flange up to the internal wall of your collection or your gallbladder or your um, uh, small bowel lumen. So you're gonna unlock that catheter lock in order to allow you to make that movement, pull the back the catheter handle, and here's where you wanna visualize the stent beginning to deform because what that means is that it's now hitting the inside of that wall and it's in the proper place for you to start 
to think about deploying the second flange and it's going to create that apposition. We, we kind of refer to things like football or sometimes a, um, uh, an egg shape. And that again, just is really implying that something is pressing down against that flange to cause it um, de to deform. It is worth noting that when the 20 millimeter stent came out, there was a slight difference in the way that we sort of talked about it being at an optimal position. Um, in this, when you deploy this stent, you actually see the introducer kind of move eccentrically towards the superior edge of the flange. And that is actually more of an indicator that you're in the right place um, to, de to deploy the second um, flange. And then of course, once you're finished doing this maneuver, you wanna make sure that you lock the catheter lock prior to deploying that second flange. So this is step three, we're unlocking the catheter here, we're pulling back and you see as it pulls back, it sort of um, creates this deformity in the, in the flange here. This is a 20 millimeter, so it's not as much of a deformity and really the focus also is on this. This is the introducer and it kind of eccentrically is moving towards this superior edge of the flange. And then, of course, the fourth, stent, uh, the fourth uh, step is the deployment of the second flange. Again, we currently recommend this to be done under EUS guidance. And actually what that means is that you don't see anything happen because you are really just deploying the flange within the channel of the scope itself. Um, and you'll see in the video that, that it's, neither, it's neither EUS guidance nor endoscopic guidance, nothing happens, but you don't really need to visualize the catheter itself. You wanna unlock the stent lock, and then um, important also not to really move your scope um, during this, uh, this maneuver um, in order not to pull out the first, pull the stent out of the entire collection. So for step four, again, here you see nothing happen. You unlock this and you start to pull up and you can do this very quickly. Um, and just one more time, nothing's actually happening here. So, if you don't see anything move, don't worry, because the stent is just being deployed within the channel of the scope itself. You see it get pushed out just a little bit here, and that might be from a slight movement of the, um, of the, the stent uh, forward as the final um, flange comes out. And then this last fifth, what I call the fifth step or added step, is really just pull, pushing the deployed stent out of the scope. And for this, you can switch and you should switch to your endoscopic view. Um, so again, important not to move the scope too much before um, making sure that the stent is fully out because the, you could pull, if you pull back too much with your scope, you could pull that stent out of the collection. You switch to your endo view, you unlock the catheter, and now you're gonna use the catheter kind of as a pusher with some abrupt movements back and forth. You big wheel away very gently, to be able to see the lumen wall and you start to see the stent itself, you might uh, torque the scope a little bit to the right um, and back and forth. And again, this is just kind of gently allowing the stent to, deployed stent to come out of the channel of the scope itself. Um, and then you'll be able to visualize that stent. If you are going to do further work or you're worried about the placement and you think there might be misdeployment or impending misdeployment, you want to make sure you get your wire in. So before taking the, the, the um, introducer delivery system out, you can insert the wire through the, the wire port um, directly into the space that you just created access. So step five, um, you're just unlocking the catheter. And then here, we're just going to push down on it a little bit. And as we do that, we look away with the big wheel and you see the stent um, be fully deployed. And then all together, this is just the, the video in summary, catheter coming out, apply cautery, insert, all the way, deploy the first stent, pull back, create apposition, deploy the second flange in the channel of the scope, you see nothing, and then you push that deployed stent out. This is then followed by placement of a wire. And in this particular case, early on, we were dilating and then placing a double pigtail stent. I don't dilate anymore, um, but certainly do place double pigtail stents now. And to, with regards to the question of double pigtail stents and when, when I use them, um, 
So I use them certainly for anything that has some degree of necrosis or thick material to, in order to make sure that we're preventing uh, occlusion of the lumen. Um, even though these are wide lumen stents, they certainly, some of this material can certainly get in the way as can food um, and, and contents within the stomach. If it's an infected pseudocyst and you want to make sure that you're maximizing drainage um, to help clinically with the patient, or you might be placing a nasocystic tube along with um, the double lumen stents. Um, for EUS gallbladder drainage in order to um, ensure that there's no migration of the stent because that's still possible since you have two free floating um, uh, lumens. And then if there's concern for a disconnected duct syndrome from the beginning, then I typically place the double pigtail stent, even if it's just a fluid filled collection, because it will allow for there to be some amount of space so that when I return to remove the axios, I can still leave in a double pigtail stent um, indefinitely in order to help manage the disconnected duct syndrome. And then fluoroscopy, as I mentioned, this can really be done by EUS alone, but when should you consider using fluoroscopy? So I actually think it's important to use it if you have really thick necrosis um, as determined on pre-procedural imaging. And one of the reasons is that sometimes that necrosis, necrotic material can be so thick that it actually impedes the deployment of that first stent. And it, that can sometimes be a little difficult to detect fully on EUS. And you know it's important to know whether or not your, the flange has really started to open because if you pull back to create the apposition and it hasn't opened enough, then you will just um, pull the stent through, pull the stent out. So fluoro kind of helps in that situation. In addition, if you're planning to do um, immediate necrosectomy afterwards, it's certainly helpful during those maneuvers to have fluoroscopy. If you're gonna leave a nasocystic tube, um, you, you do wanna have that as well in order to make sure as you're pulling the scope out that the tube is still staying in place. And then I think that you should use fluoroscopy for any non, um, fluid collection indications such as the, the gallbladder drainage, DJs, a, even afferent limb syndromes, which can oftentimes be very simple and, and mimic pseudocyst collections. Um, but you do want to make sure that you're on the right side of the obstruction, um, which, which oftentimes uh, could benefit from using contrast and fluoroscopy. And then procedures like EDGE, again, where you want to use contrast um, to really understand where you are um, location-wise. Uh, for sedation, Vinay, you touched on this earlier, so I won't um, focus too much, but if you have a large collection that you anticipate at least a liter of fluid coming out, you probably want to um, intubate um, in order to prevent aspiration. If you're going to do some longer work like necrosectomy or irrigate with saline or hydrogen peroxide, I certainly recommend um, general anesthesia. And then if you are going to do procedures such as GJs or edges, in which, in which cases there are certain increased risk of adverse events that might require salvage maneuvers, such as notes type procedures. And then again, I certainly recommend uh, general anesthesia and definitely using CO2. Um, Anthony is going to talk about this, so I won't focus, but the main complications um, that you see here, I just mentioned very briefly, um, quick ways to prevent them. For bleeding, certainly you want to do pre-procedure imaging, which hopefully you're doing anyways, using color Doppler during the placement. Um, for pneumoperitoneum, if it does occur, um, some needle decompression could help, and then the fully covered aspect of the stent should help seal the leak. Um, stent migration during the procedure itself, um, quickly establish wire access if you're concerned, and then place a larger fully covered metal stent through the lumen of the axios for delayed migration. Um, double pigtail stents have been shown to help for tract occlusion and infection as well. Um, and for pseudoaneurysm bleeds, for example, again, pre-procedural imaging and IR embolization prior to drainage um, is, is how I proceed. In terms of removal, um, in, ter the, in terms of uh, my protocols based on Shyam Vardarajulu's work, um, I think uh, this has become routine to perform some type of imaging about three weeks post-placement. And if the collection is nearly resolved, um, 
then to repeat the procedure uh, one to two weeks later with stent removal. And again, think about leaving a double pigtail stent if, for example, if there is uh, a decent enough pocket or if there's a disconnected duct syndrome. If further necrosectomy is needed, then repeat with removal and placement of multiple double, double pigtail stents. And or you can replace the Axios, although it's certainly not um, an indicated use of the stent and it can be removed simply with rat tube forceps or a snare. So in summary, um, I think it's really important to understand the components of the stent and the delivery system in order to make this as easy and efficient as possible and also to deal with the um, potential complications as they occur and salvage your procedure. Think of it as the, the, think of the handle as a catheter aspect and a stent aspect and understand the five steps of deployment um, should get you through any procedure. Early recognition of that misdeployment is really important and then kind of pausing and stopping to manage uh, prior to continuing should allow you to still have success. And some of these ancillary issues, I think, just depend on the indication. Thank you. Thanks, Amrita. Wonderful uh, lecture. <laughs> uh, you created. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, coordination of the two side by side uh, very very nice uh, videos and uh, the fifth step i liked it's it's i think it's it's a, it's a good idea to think of it as five rather than uh, four steps so there is a question um, from the audience is it necessary to see the black mark endoscopically during step 3 um, no, it's not. So I think that if you see that deformity start to occur in the, um, the in the first in the, the deployed flange within the collection, that's an indicate that's an indication that the flange is all the way up against the wall, and that um, you can actually uh, proceed with the deployment of the second flange. Again, remembering that the flange is going to get deployed in the channel of the scope. It's really important that you make sure that you, the indication for doing the procedure is right in the sense that you don't want the distance between the wall of the lumen and the wall of the collection to be greater than a centimeter. And I think you alluded to that when you were talking. If that distance is too great, then there's a problem um, because that means that you might be all the way up against the wall, but you're, you're, you haven't reached the internal inside of the, the lumen. If you choose to do it endoscopically, then yes, you must see the black mark. Um, prior to, to deploying the second flange. Okay, and there's another question. What is the... Oh, one more thing, Vinay. I would say that for, and I think Manolo and, and others might comment, might be able to comment as well, that for, for GJs and gallbladders, and not as much gallbladder, but for GJ, I would say that looking, confirming the black mark is a little bit more important than in any of these other... Um, other procedures. So there I do keep like a picture in picture and I do have a little bit of view of that black mark. Okay. Uh, another one question unrelated to Axios, uh, hydrogen peroxide, what is the strength that you use? Um, I use a one-to-one -one dilu dilution. Um, so it's, I think it's a 6% hydrogen peroxide solution that we have here. And then I fill like a 300, uh, my syringe is a 60 cc syringe and I do 50% um, 50, uh, 50 um, saline and 50% hydrogen peroxide. I don't use it that much. And if I do use it, and then, and in terms of how much I place, probably about 120 um, cc's I kind of flush it through, I let it sit for a minute, and then I suction it all out. Again, I don't want there to be hydrogen peroxide sitting around in the stomach and during extubation, this, you know, um, the patient aspirates because that can be quite dangerous. Okay, thanks, Amrita. That was wonderful, uh, fantastic lecture. Um, let's move Thank on. Thank you again for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Last of the day, Anthony is with us, a very, very important uh, lecture uh, about the prevention of adverse events of EUS guided uh, drainage. Thank you. So, uh, good evening, everyone. So, um, it's getting late in Hong Kong, but uh, I'll try my best and uh, talk about um, adverse events. 
So I think to many of us uh, practicing uh, intervention in the U.S., uh, having adverse events is uh, like a nightmare uh, because uh, very often uh, management it will be difficult and then you're struggling with a lot of things. Um, I think, and I think uh, to different people, uh, nightmares mean different things. So to me at home, uh, sometimes my kids, they are nightmares. To some of us, Trump can be a nightmare, but to all of us, COVID is uh, the big, our biggest nightmare. So um, when I first started doing US, uh, one of uh, my teachers told me, um, in intervention in the US, when you succeed, everyone praises you and you become a hero because you are able to do something that most people can't do. But uh, if something happens, if you misdeploy a stand or you, you do uh, some adverse events happens, you fail miserably. So uh, why is that? So when something happens, a complication, adverse events happen during the procedure. So for example, misdeployment of stent, then you have two problems to deal with now. One is the initial indication, and two is how to salvage the issue that you have created. So um, if you are just starting to do these procedures, you really need to ask yourself, several questions. First, um, are you able to, will you be able to deal with the complication yourself? Should you continue the procedure or you, should you go to plan B? There is often a percutaneous or surgical options for these patients. Um, and if you do choose to continue the procedure, uh, can the pa patient tolerate another procedure or even another failure? Uh, do you have some, someone uh, who has more experience around you that can do a better job than you uh, and help you with the procedure? Do we need to ask other colleagues, friends, in most other dis disciplines uh, to help you? So it's a lot of questions that you need to think about, especially during a very stressful time when something happens, but you should think about it before you uh, embark on uh, uh, salvaging, salvaging the procedure. So uh, potential issues, uh, stem misdeployment, stem migration, blockade, perforation, foot impaction, bleeding. Uh, I think for me, the first few, uh, sh most of the time nowadays can still be dealt with uh, endoscopically. Um, bleeding, uh, most of the time we can deal with endoscopically, but sometimes we would need a multidisciplinary in involvement. Okay, so I'm gonna go through uh, these uh, complications at various events. Uh, some of uh, many are my uh, own experiences, uh, but I'm glad I'm not um, increasing uh, the number of videos in my collections. Um, this is uh, one of our earlier cases in gallbladder drainage. So um, case two, uh, stand was inserted into the gallbladder uh, from the stomach. Distal flange deployed, proximal mark for proximal flange not seen. I was struggling to um, see the, the flange, eventually deployed the proximal flange uh, because um, the, I didn't see the proximal mark, so the stand was not long enough and then migrated into gallbladder. So because the wire was in situ, so I was able to put in a uh, additional uh, straight stand uh, 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 through the wire. So. Um, if you are new to these procedures, having a wire is uh, very important because it can help save you and also can salvage, uh, help you salvage the procedure. So at this time, we were still using the code axial, so, so we needed to um, uh, insert the guide wire, uh, the either track, followed by um, uh, insertion of the stent. So right here, you can see I was struggling. I deployed the distal flange. My scope position, I was trying to pull back to see the proximal flange. At that time, we were still not practicing the intrascope deployment. And then you can see I was struggling. I was trying to pull my scope, talk my scope sidewards, pulling, pulling, and eventually, um, I think I deployed the stent. But uh, the entire stand was in the gallbladder, so I had to insert an additional uh, straight metal stand on wire, so as to finally bridge the um, 
with deployed uh, Axios. So this is the final uh, image. You can see axials in the gallbladder and a straight stent uh, between the gallbladder and the stomach. This is a CT scan, the gallbladder, um, the stent in the gallbladder, and then a um, uh, 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 straight metal stent bridging the gallbladder to the uh, stomach. So when you first start to doing these procedures, uh, especially if you're not very familiar with it, the why is very important. You should have a uh, good guard of the wire, making sure it doesn't um, um, come out of the target organ uh, prematurely because um, if anything happens, you can still use it to salvage the procedure. Um, this patient, um, um, uh, again, another gallbladder drainage. Uh, we now advocate um, um, deploying from the, the duodenum. Uh, this was the plan for this patient initially, but um, she was actually on long-term cholecystoscopy, so I had to struggle a bit to see I have a good view of the gallbladder. Um, but at the end, uh, I deployed the stent and found out that I was actually uh, at the entrum. So the problem of this stent is that um, it's almost obscuring the pylorus. Food would preferentially go through the stent into the gallbladder. So uh, several issues. So again, uh, there's a risk of recurring cholecystitis as well. So um, in, in a, at an attempt to prevent food from going into the axials, I placed two blue plastic stents, kept the patient faster for longer because she was on percutaneous cholecystostomy, I had daily, daily aspiration, but uh, there were small amounts of food uh, residue, residue aspirated out every day. So this is what it looks like on x-ray. You can see the axios plus two double picture plastic stand and the percutaneous drain. So what to do next? Um, I know the patient uh, is having small amounts of food going inside the gallbladder. Uh, the stand was quite recently inserted, so I cannot really remove it because the tract is not well formed. She is very old and uh, probably not, in, uh, not a candidate for cholecystectomy. So at that time, I was trying to, planning to sit tight, uh, keep the percutaneous drain, uh, um, uh, have a regular aspiration, uh, and hopefully uh, wait, can wait long enough to remove the stand early and uh, close the track. Um, the patient uh, suffered from uh, several episodes of sepsis. So I had to repeat o OGD twice because uh, there were a lot of food getting to the gallbladder. Uh, her percutaneous uh, drain unfortunately slipped out uh, during one of these procedures and in an attempt to try to um, um, uh, block food from getting inside the gallbladder, I was actually able to insert up to nine plastic stents into the gallbladder. So this is what it looks like. And still, there is still some space uh, between the stents into the, the, the gallbladder. So food was still getting into to, uh, the gallbladder and she was still uh, having some uh, on and off sepsis. So finally, um, two weeks has passed. It was the longest two weeks for this patient. Um, and um, um, this is what it looks like. So um, the stent was here. There's a lot of food. Uh, I used the rough net. Uh, I thought it was going to take a long time, but eventually um, all the food was uh, removed. So I decided to uh, remove the uh, axios as well. So all this food. The goblet has clear stones. So I removed the stent. You can see almost like a double pylorus appearance. So luckily at that time, we still have, um, we have the uh, overstitch. So I used the overstitch to close the opening. And this is what it looks like after stitching. So luckily I was able to uh, overcome this issue. So this is a CT scan. Uh, afterwards, and uh, no contrast was going into gallbladder. 
But uh, during management of this patient, this is also a very interesting phenomenon. So uh, I, we, I witnessed the migration of gallbladder stent. So this is what it looks like on day zero. Day 11, you can see the stent already migrating out of the stomach. And day 17, almost completely gone. So um, what is happening is that um, I just want to show you the anatomy. So this is um, the uh, patient with acute cholecystitis uh, during surgery. So after clearing all this momentum, this is gallbladder. Um, this is the duodenum and this is the antrum. So if you drain from the antrum, it's actually a fair distance from the gallbladder. But if you drain from the duodenum, it's right next to the gallbladder. So when you drain from the uh, antrum, you're actually pushing the stomach towards the gallbladder, place the stent in it here. And although it looks very, uh, looks like the stent, the gallbladder and the stomach is very close, um, actually there's some tension. And when you remove the scope, the stomach tends to go back to its original place and essentially the stand is being pulled out like a very bumpy uh, condition. So that's what's happening. Um, stand migration, um, during HCS, uh, I think we had some discussion about this uh, during various uh, uh, lectures. Um, I think uh, in terms of biliary drainage, HCS is probably the most uh, complicated one. Um, there are several reasons for this. Uh, the IHC is smaller uh, or, or to puncture. Uh, guideline man manipulation is sometimes difficult. Stand placement, we need uh, to have a nice landing site in the liver. We need to have a longer stand in the stomach. And um, there is also a risk of stand uh, related complications like migration. So um, during HCS, uh, you need to be aware there are two dents. One is the uh, where the stand um, comes out from the uh, liver, and the other dent is uh, where the stent um, is uh, uh, entering the stomach. So Manolo said we try to decrease this distance as much as possible. I totally agree, um, but uh, you have to uh, be aware that uh, these are the points where the stent is entering or exiting various uh, organs. So in the past, uh, if stand migration happens, uh, then uh, we uh, have no option but uh, to do surgery. Uh, this is uh, one of the earlier cases where a stand has migrated out of the stomach. You can see a big hole in the stomach and this is uh, in the hole in the liver. Uh, I think some of you may have seen this case. Um, we try to salvage uh, this uh, misdeployed HCS uh, endoscopically. Uh, I know Manolo has a video of uh, doing a similar procedure with notes. Um, I think um, if we, for me, if we can do it endoscopically, uh, of course I would prefer that. So in this uh, patient, initially part was okay. Uh, it seems that the stand deployment uh, was inside the, um, uh, the GI tract. But I think my trainee, try to see the push the stent back into the stomach this is still deploying right here the scope is being pushed and actually the entire uh, system push into the peritoneal cavity so this is something that shouldn't have been done so right here the entire stand is in the uh, cavity in the peritoneal cavity why is still in situ? So um, the initial plan was to um, uh, put use this wire to insert an additional stent. So what to do? Um, again, um, when it has this happens, um, we need to think about uh, options. Of course, we can. Well, the initial aim is try to do a stent on stent. But of course, um, if you don't have the confidence of doing so, you should think about other options. So uh, unfortunately, during the insertion of a additional stand, the wire came out as well. So now I have no access. There's a big hole right there. Uh, I wasn't so brave uh, as Manolo to do a notes retrieval. So I decided to close this opening first with the uh, OTSC clip. And after closure, 
I changed back to a year scope. And right there, I had a very nice position with the stent. So I th thought this might be a good angle for um, uh, puncturing and also in inserting a guide wire it into the uh, lumen of the stent and perform a, a stent on stent uh, placement. So needle coming out right there. Change the angle of the scope. Wire going inside. Now I have a very stable scope position. It's long scope position, but it's stable. The wire going through the misdeployed XGS and back into the bow duct. And then afterwards, it's the usual um, business. Cystotome followed by balloon and then stent on stent. So this is one way you can try to uh, salvage a misdeployed uh, HES into the peritoneal cavity. And um, we were happy afterwards. But of course, it may not be always be possible. Uh, I had a very, I was very lucky that this HGS was in a nice position. If the stand was pointing downwards, then uh, it would be much more difficult to salvage uh, uh, using the US. So post procedurally, this patient was fine um, and uh, discharged uh, back to the Colin Hospital. Perforation, uh, this is again an uh, interesting case, acute cholecystitis, called drainage done. Uh, first half done by my trainee, everything was fine. And then I decided to take the scope off him uh, because I wanted to have a better uh, drainage of the gallbladder. So the stent was facing towards the duodenal wall. So I had to do a top maneuver to try to look to see the opening of the stent. So pay attention while I was trying to do this. I turn. And then I try to turn it and then suddenly I see this. So, so I'm going to show you again. Okay. All right. I turn and I suddenly see the extra peritoneal uh, fat. So I was a bit puzzled what happened. And then uh, I go back inside. There's, there was a lot of blood. Seems like the stand is still there. So, and then I was trying to assess the damage that I've done. There's a hole right there. There's a row hole right there. It's actually right next to the stand. So what I've done is actually I made, I have entered the space between a newly created and a stomosis between the stand and the duodenum. And on contrast injection, you can see leakage. So um, no choice, have to try to close this endoscopically. I wasn't sure if this was possible. Um, I added a few clips around that hole. So more clips over this uh, remaining opening. And then eventually uh, I was happy because uh, I was able to close the hole. There was no more uh, contrast leakage. And um, uh, it was uh, quite a stupid mistake uh, on my side. Um, bleeding. So this is um, one of the older cases, a patient with a pseudocyst or water necrosis. So this was actually drained by plastic stents. And after two weeks later, the patient came with sepsis, HP drop. You can see some fluid outside in this uh, little uh, subphrenic area. Plastic stent is still inside you. There's a lot of blood clot and substance in the stomach. Stents are still present. But you can see the two lumens right here, this uh, fluid collection and the stomach is actually separating. 
So this happened obviously uh, after drainage. Um, why is it separating? Uh, my postulation was um, the the collection was actually drained too high in the lesser temperature. So when the collection collapses, it actually goes away uh, uh, from the stomach. And when the track separates, it creates a, a site of bleeding. So um, when there's bleeding, what to do next? Um, again, several options. Um, because the patient wasn't uh, actively uh, having hematemesis, I decided to go in with endoscopy and take a look. And initially, this is a plastic stand. Actually, I didn't see any bleeding. Um, the track was a bit small. I had to dilate with a balloon. So after dilation, I went inside the um, collection. There are a lot of um, solid material. But as I was uh, coming out doing necrosectomy, I saw a glimpse of blood. So I s figured out I should go inside. And there is just blood everywhere. So at this juncture, you try to stay calm. You, I insert the scope uh, deeper. I didn't edit this video at all because I just want to let you see how frustrating the, the feel the pressure. Uh, just now you had a glimpse of a uh, fountain of blood. So very poor visibility. Uh, only so I could see a vessel right there. So I thought this is my only chance. I overshoot my scope into the um, collection. I open the clip. I pull back. I wait for the opportunity. So right here is a vessel. Luckily, I have a stent, which is kind of helping me. Right there. So I decided to give it a try. So now or never, right? So the clip is deformed, a little bit worried. But uh, I have a good position. So we decide to close the clip. Slowly, 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 please. And then we were able to catch it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think most people would have gone for angio. Um, haven't seen such a bit leader, but um, this is possible as well. Um, okay, how are we going with time? Okay. So, Perhaps just uh, one more case. This is actually a case from uh, Itoi Sensei. Uh, HGS, a uh, patient with a recurrent uh, C erectum, a little metastasis, um, had PTBD performed, requested for internal drainage. This is a difficult case. So um, there are several options. Uh, of course, you can do internalization from PTBD or HGS. I think he decided to do a PTP uh, HS. So this is a difficult case because the duct is completely non dilated. Uh, but have no, uh, no need to know he has exceptional skills. So, first, contrast injection. And on US view, you know the ducts are completely non dilated. So the only way to see it was to find the location of the catheter and use this as a mark right there. So, but there's also a vessel right in front of the, 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 the bile duct. So what should we do next? Stop the procedure, continue procedure. 
of course, knowing Italy, we continued. So um, the needle going through here. Right there. The vein is right there. Duck is here. So puncture or not puncture. Eventually, he went through. But it seems to be going through and through the main. Okay, so at this point, uh, I'm not sure how many of you would proceed uh, because uh, knowing that you have punctured through the vein, um, it's a chance uh, of uh, causing uh, much bleeding. But having said that, uh, after going through the vein, the wire was also going into the bowel duct. So I think uh, Itoi decided to proceed with cystotome down the track, but now we have a problem. A lot of bleeding right here. You can see blood collecting um, in between the liver and the stomach. It seems to work quite fast. So um, no choice. So the only option is try, try to complete the procedure as quickly as possible. And hopefully uh, with this metal stent, it can help compress on the uh, bleeding site. And afterwards, seems like the uh, bleeding has stopped. So definitely um, not the, for the faint at heart. I think most of us would have stopped uh, knowing that we have punctured through the vein. So, um, but then if there is bleeding, uh, I think this is a good case showing that the metal stent can actually help uh, compress on uh, the bleeding site. So, um, afterwards, uh, I think the patient had an infection of the collection, but uh, that was dealt with easily. So, um, I probably won't finish uh, talking about this case because of time, time constraints. And, um, I'll just finish with this slide. So tips and tricks, have a very good planning because um, most of the ES procedures, once you start, you have no choice but to complete it. So you need to have good planning, think of uh, options, uh, think of potential issues, always have a plan B if it doesn't, uh, planning doesn't work. Um, go slow, uh, if you're attempting something new, uh, have someone experience uh, around you because uh, there is no room for error. Uh, very often these are one-shot procedures. Uh, have good uh, nursing staff. Uh, if you're performing uh, some difficult procedures, um, accessorize yourself. Uh, this is very important. Um, it is very frustrating if you run into problems and you don't have the proper gear to, to deal with it and uh, try to look for a backup. So uh, um, complications in interventional ES can be terrifying. Uh, make slow, cautious steps in learning US. Be friends with the urologists and surgeons. It's very important. Uh, initial learning best in the presence of experience in the sonographers. But um, definitely it will be great rewards in successful cases. And uh, it's a very exciting uh, time for interventional ES. So thank you for your attention. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, it's past midnight in Hong Kong. Yeah, 12.30. <laughs> you are showing us horror movies. <laughs> Fantastic collection of cases. Fantastic collection. My God. It's yeah. really not for the faint, faint at heart. Yes. And but hopefully everyone learns something and not um, go through the same mistakes that I made. No, but brilliant cases. Fantastic collection of cases. I think a fitting finale uh, to the webinar. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't want to ask any questions now. <clears throat> Laura, can we have a good uh, group photo of everybody who is present? Hi, Ali. Where were you? <laughs> I didn't see you in the whole uh, webinar. <laughs> is Amrita there? 
Lawrence, no, Lawrence is too late. Ken Dixon. Okay, I think uh, this is all. Okay. Let's take a good picture. Can Smile. You... Okay. Thank all you. right. Taken. Thank you very much. Thank yes. you, Vinay. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, Olympus. Thanks, mm -hmm. Jason. Thanks, Arun. Thanks, Flora, Manolo, Lazaro, Ellie, and Anthony, of course. Thanks a lot. It was a wonderful, wonderful learning session. We learned so much today. And Thank great, you, Vinay. Practical as Excellent. well as educational. Very, very nice. I'm very, very happy. Thanks, and uh, let's wait for the next webinar. Um, let's do it better than this one. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, sir.